Good afternoon, everyone. I call to order this meeting of the Board of Trustees for Santa Barbara City College. Will everyone stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance? For the record, uh, all members of the Board of Trustees are present. Let me say a few welcoming comments for everyone. We have a full house here today. At least it's almost uh, full. I noticed the parking lot was, uh, was full. And we welcome each and every one of you. There are a few items that many of you want to address during public comments, and I assure you we are here to listen and understand your concerns. That is why we decided to move the meeting to this larger venue. And on behalf of the board, I welcome all of you. First, I want to explain that in order to speak during the public comment portion of our meeting, which will occur very shortly, at the start of our agenda, you will need to fill out a speaker form. I believe many of you have already done that. It is what we use to call you to come forward to the podium. We need to collect the forms from everyone who wants to speak. We have two members, uh, two staff members, handing out the forms. Please raise your hand if you need a speaker slip, and they will help you out. I just see one hand, a couple hands, one here and one back, back of the room. If somebody could get a speaker slip to them. Liz got it. And the staff who are collecting the uh, forms will stay in the aisles to collect them uh, while we continue to make uh, introductory remarks, but we need them uh, filled out and turned in before we uh, begin or con continue with our uh, agenda. Second, I want to announce that we have an adjustment to tonight's agenda. The presenter on the Ombuds program, Bruce McAllister from Santa Fe, New Mexico, had flight problems due to weather and couldn't make it. So we're working to reschedule his presentation at hopefully our next meeting. The idea for an Ombuds program that is designed to address on-campus complaints and difficult issues arose last fall out of work by the board's ad hoc committee on equity and we're eager to further consider the ombuds program. Most importantly tonight, I want to acknowledge the significant news we received last week that Dr. Beebe will be retiring this summer as he faces health-related matters that need attention. As a board, we are sorry that he's made this decision, but we fully support him. He will continue to have our complete confidence during his remaining time with us, and we've told him emphatically that his health comes first. This board will soon begin the process to select an interim superintendent president and ultimately turn to the selection process of a permanent leader for the college You'll hear more from us as the process proceeds. Our next item on the agenda is recognitions. We don't have any recognitions uh, this evening. So we are now going to move to public comment. I'd like to explain a few ground rules for, public, for the public comment portion of our meeting. Some of you here today have been here before, but some of you are here for the first time. So let me walk through a few items. The purpose of the public comment period is to give you an opportunity to share your opinions with us. The most important role we have and will enforce that there is to be no talking over a speaker 
or making noise while someone is speaking. And I thank you advance, in advance for honoring that rule. To paraphrase something I read by an opinion writer yesterday, quote, the First Amendment is built on the right and even obligation to speak up and when needed to protest, but not to interrupt and prevent others from speaking, close quote. Do we have all the speaker slips? Okay. We have, I think, uh, 60 speaker slips, which is certainly uh, <laughs> far more than I think we have ever had while I've been on the board. But let me say that our rules set a, uh, set a 20 minute combined limit for each subject addressed in public comment and a five minute limit for each speaker. But as you can see, we have a very large number of attendees who want to address us. And as the, as the chair, I have the discretion to adjust the limits. Thus, in order for everyone to have a chance to speak, I decided not to impose the 20 minute limitation, but enforce a two minute time limit for each speaker. Do I hear any objections to that limitation by the board? You, one can say a speak uh, Trustee Haslin. One can say a great deal in two minutes. Three minutes? No, two minutes. Two, two minutes. Two minutes. One can say a great deal in two minutes. Actually, I think one can say a great deal in one minute. So recognizing the numbers, it would be appreciated if you, particularly if you find that. Well, let's see. Just be closer. How is that? It's not, it's not working. Now? Yeah, there you go. Oh, so do I get to start all over again? No. No. <laughs> so you did hear me, didn't you? <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I mean, we, the point is, we can make, you can, it's, especially when we start getting repetition, it would, it would be helpful if you'd just curtail your comments. Okay. Just a few more uh, ground rules. Uh, please note that our rules do not allow you to give your allotted time to other speakers. We want to hear from you directly. And in order to accommodate everyone, I request that you, were not, that you not repeat arguments made by others. If, if everyone can follow that rule, we will hear all of the uh, comments that you want to provide us in a shorter amount of time. I'd also ask that you please direct your comments to the board and not anyone in the audience. As I said, we want to hear from you, and that's what this section of our agenda is all about. Finally, we'll be calling up speakers three at a time so that you can get up, make your way to the podium, stand behind the current speaker, and be ready to address us. This will ensure a more efficient and timely process. If you arrive at the podium and have no comments or conclude before your two minutes, we'll proceed to call the next speaker. Be ready to step forward, please. One of the most confusing aspects of this public comment period is a state law that prevents us from responding to you. We can only publicly discuss topics that are on the printed agenda. So while we get to and want to hear your comments, we may not be able to reply to questions or respond to the issues you raise. Believe me, this is as frustrating for us as it is for you. I'll add that the board may decide to take a race, recess at some given point in the meeting. That is a right we have, and we may exercise it. Some of you may have signs, which we fully understand and support. We only ask that you keep in mind the safety of everyone here and that you not block the view of anyone behind or around you. Finally, there may be times that you are asked to avoid a certain activity or action. You must obey these requests. Again, this is for the safety of all and also so that we can all hear one another in a respectful manner. Thank you again for adhering to these simple but important rules. I believe we're now ready to begin the public comment portion.
and I've asked uh, Board Vice President Haslin to assist me tonight in calling on speakers. The first three speakers, Bob Dorn, Grace Wallace, and Jill Rivera, in that order. Uh, first speaker, Bob Dorn. <clears throat> uh, yes, my name is Bob Dorn. I've lived in Santa Barbara since 1952. I'm not going to give you my age, but I'm, I'm getting up there. Uh, moved recently to Idaho because some of the things that's been happening to Santa Barbara has concerned me. But beyond that, um, I just had, I'm not going to even get it out. In 2001, I was there at Santa Barbara City College when we made a flag. I don't know if anybody remembered that. Very good. But they made, we made a flag colors in the stands. And the flag that I have here has the Pledge of Allegiance written inside of it. Well, but it's, it's uh, God bless America, and then on the back it has the Pledge of Allegiance and, and all kinds of things. But anyway, I've just saved these. I don't know why, but I think I know why now. Uh, it's important that we remember our history, important that we remember uh, that oftentimes these days, maybe our education system, maybe our, our lackadaisical nature of old people. We'd ask you we if you could care how much I'm sorry. time do I have? No, if we just ask if you could please address the board rather than the audience. Oh, I'm sorry. In the timer, the timer I should have. I got 45 seconds. There you go. It's like like a shock clock in basketball. I'll try to be brief and make a point or two. Um, I'm a teacher. I had applied at uh, Santa Barbara City College to teach there uh, history. And also, I used to uh, I used to teach elementary school and junior high school all the way up. And I wanted to teach in a bad way, but I finally went up to uh, the Bay Area and taught there. So I have about 10 seconds left. I just hope everybody understands how important this issue is to each one of us, but mainly our kids and grandkids. Grace Wallace. Is my Good mic evening, on? President Robert Miller, Board of Trustees, staff, and visitors. I come before you very heart, heavy hearted, shocked, appalled, flabbergasted that an American citizen who lay his head down at night under the stars of freedom and arise each morning privileged to walk in all its benefits would be so ungrateful to dishonor its symbol of freedom personally, but also to silence others from saying the pledge, a pledge of allegiance to old glory, our flag, our country, America. Our flag was first uh, brought about June 14, 1777. It will forever stand for strength, freedom, justice, and yes, faith in God in which our nation is founded. We, when we stand to pledge our allegiance to the flag, we put our hands over our heart and we say with all our hearts, we appreciate the freedom, we appreciate the privileges that our, and the peace that our flag afford unto us. Uh, we also, we love our constitution that keeps us free. Our flag is a symbol of hope to the world. People risk their lives, scale walls, tread waters to come to America. Land of the free, home of the brave. We live in a society where the word racist is used for everything. Uh, un anything that's ungodly, uh, un uh, unpatriotic, they use the word racism. I'm going to tell you about true racism. Racism is when you go into a store and you would not be waited on even after you ask for help and you see them waiting on someone else Caucasian. True racism is finding out that my son been called the N-word for in his new school. That's true racism. Yep, 30 seconds remaining. I would like to end by saying, we all rest under the banner of protection. 
our brave soldiers have died for our freedom. And I say to you this day, let, uh, let it be said of us, of our generation, that when a nation teeter on the edge of destruction, having lost the ancient path of truth and righteousness, we answer the divine call to war for its restoration and appeal to heaven, junk sheets. I strongly urge you to reinstate the pledge of the allegiance uh, to our nation. I say this to the board. Thank you. The next speaker is Jill Rivera, and next up will be Phil Cochran. Good afternoon, board, president. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to come and speak and for honoring the community's request to reinstate the pledge. Um, one of my favorite parts of the Pledge of Allegiance is the last line with indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And you know, just saying the house divided can't stand. And you know, divided our nation is weak, but together we are strong. And so I'm just making an appeal for unity. And the decisions that you make, would you consider unity being something that we should all aspire to? Um, one of the quotes that's actually on the yacht of John F. Kennedy's uh, boat says, where we go one, we go all. And I think that should be something that we should aspire to. Thank you. Thank you. Phil Cochran is next speaker, and next up is Daniel Ijan. Yeah, my name is Phil Conran. I'm sorry. No my, problem. My mistake. What that young lady said is exactly what I was going to say. I plead with you to, it is totally nonpartisan, but I won't read the letter I was going to state because she has already stated it. Reinstate the Pledge of Allegiance before every meeting that we have open to the public. Thank you. Next speaker is Daniel Ijen, and next up is Jeremy Purvis. Trustees of Santa Barbara City College, thank you for opening up this forum to hear from the community. I'm here as an alumni of Santa Barbara City College, 2000, 2001, 2002, so it's been a while. Uh, I appreciate your time. Today, on trial is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. The pledge is a declaration, a commitment, and it's a dream. The declaration is that we're one nation under God. The commitment is that we commit to being one nation that can't be divided. The dream is liberty and justice for all. Within this pledge, we challenge one another regularly to live a dream. We commit to stand together and remind one another that we're indivisible. We cannot and will not be divided, and we declare that we're under God. In, a, in the pledge, we express our dreams and values, liberty and justice for all, every age, every race, everyone. Perhaps some do not dream this dream or respect the republic we enjoy. It's their constitutional right to stand silent, to speak, to kneel, to sit and listen. Freedom is a beautiful, cherished privilege here in the United States. Perhaps America's greatest dreamer, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., said it best in his famous last speech, his last words, I've been to the mountaintop, you can YouTube it. He said this, all we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. We need not destroy the paper, only live up to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker is Jeremy Purvis, and next up is Stephen Penner. Stephen Penner. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Jeremy Purvis, and I am a combat veteran of the Iraq War. During my time in Iraq, 
I was honored to serve with brothers and sisters whose ancestry was, was of all races, colors, and creeds. Some of us are here today because the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag has been recently criticized as racist and white supremacist. In our current poisonous political climate, we believe it is important to protect what is still true and what is still of value. It is true that every flag represents something. What is it that the American flag represents that merits our allegiance? I pledge allegiance to this flag because it flies for men like John Lawrence, who, while fighting in the American Revolution, wrote that Americans could not contend with good grace for liberty until they ended slavery. On August 27, 1782, when Lawrence was fatally knocked off his horse by a British musket ball, he died fighting under this flag. I pledge allegiance to this flag because it stood against and defeated the Confederate stars and bars, and it did so because of the blood that hundreds of thousands of men shed fighting for the North in order to do so. On July 18, 1863, when Robert yeah, Goldschmidt died with 270 of his men, it was while flying the American flag against the Confederate flag. I pledge allegiance to this flag with a military salute or with my hand over my heart because in 1942 the American salute was deliberately designed to be different from the salute that the Nazis gave to theirs. This is why pledging allegiance to the American flag and what it stands for is so valuable and I ask this board not to throw that away. Thank you. Stephen Penner is the next speaker, and next up will be Caroline Abati. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. I'm eating this microphone. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, happy Valentine's Day. My name is uh, Stephen Penner. <clears throat> I graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1971. I volunteered for a combat tour in Vietnam in 1972. I'm honored to have fired the last shot of the Vietnam War on January 28, 1973. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States because when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his fellow protesters marched in 1964, they carried the American flag with them. When thugs protested against Dr. King and his followers and tried to intimidate them and physically assault them, those thugs carried the Confederate flag. Today, as recently as August 12, 2017, neo-Nazi white supremacist thugs held a rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. If you look at the photograph of that rally, you'll see that those, those thugs carried the Nazi flag and the Confederate flag. If these same Nazi flags were to show up with their thugs in Santa Barbara, California, my friends and I will be there to stand against them. And we'll be standing under the stars and stripes. The Pledge of Allegiance was first authored by Captain George Thatcher Balch, a Union veteran of the American Civil War. If you do not believe we are a nation under God. Know that this flag represents principles that protect your rights to not believe. You have 30 seconds And that's left. why the pledge is voluntary. And everyone has a right not to say it. But some of us want to say it, just like our parents and like our grandparents. Each time in history, it has been those risking their lives under the American flag who have stood against and defeated white supremacists. My fellow veterans and I are committed to and raise our lives and risk our lives to defend this flag and what it stands for. We believe in liberty and justice for all and for stopping those who don't. That's what this flag stands for, and I ask this board not to throw it away. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Carolyn Abati, and next up will be Lorraine Woodwork. 
Members of the Santa Barbara City College Board of Trustees, thank you for allowing me to speak with you. To countless people in our country, as well as around the world, our flag has been a symbol of freedom from tyrants and the liberty to live without fear and in peace and security. To my mother, grandmother, aunt, and uncles, the sight of that American flag meant everything. It meant that they had survived the war in Nazi Germany and that they would live. They were overjoyed with relief at the sight of the American soldiers in the streets carrying that red, white, and blue flag. Yes, they speak with a strong German accent, but in their hearts and minds, they are 100% American. Our flag is a symbol of unity for our country, and saying the Pledge of Allegiance is the outward demonstration of that which is intangible, patriotism. Recently, however, on the political left, there seems to be the idea that our flag and the Pledge of Allegiance is racist, and that the phrase, one nation under God, is somehow offensive. People who think this feel they should not have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Of course, you cannot force someone to pledge allegiance to something. That must be done voluntarily, or it defeats the purpose. However, to those people, I would respectfully ask the question, where would our country be without our flag? to inspire generations of Americans to all of the ideals that have made our country as peaceful and prosperous and as enduring as she has been? And where would my mother, grandmother, aunt, and uncles be without the flag around which our brave and selfless military rallied around the cause of saving the lives of people they would never know or ever even meet? Please always say the Pledge of Allegiance at every meeting of the Board of Trustees. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you, and may each person listening have a good afternoon. Thank you. Next speaker, Lorraine Woodwork, and next up will be Tammy Bollet. Thank you, trustees and president. Um, my name is Lorraine Woodwork, and I'm here representing several students, parents, and alumni who have asked me to come and speak on the Pledge of Allegiance and why we should continue having it. Um, when we place our hand on our heart, we pledge allegiance to the flag as a free country, as a free people. And I was going to say a lot of stuff, but a lot of wonderful people have already said what I was going to say, so I'm actually going to talk personally. I personally immigrated to this country years ago and became a United States citizen. At my swearing-in ceremony, I was so proud and honored, as were thousands of other people standing in that room, to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. That meant it's a contract. It's a promise to uphold the laws of the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and even the Constitution of California. And as we did that, our hearts filled with pride. It meant we were secure, we were free. We, it's the only country on this earth where we seek to be united as a, as a whole unit, as a one people. And by standing and saying the Pledge of Allegiance, we affirm that, and that is why it's important for every meeting for public officials, and including when I think of when you were given your oath of office, you pledged allegiance to the Constitution and the State of California Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and part of that also required the Pledge of Allegiance. So what I'd like to say is public officials should begin each public meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. And if any of you refuse to uphold your oath of office, 20 seconds remaining. the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, the United States Constitution, and the California Constitution, then you must resign because when you gave that oath, you pledged that you would uphold the laws of this country. And there are no laws that, um, there actually is case law I found that says that a public meeting should begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. So therefore, I ask you to please save and affirm the Pledge of Allegiance for each of your meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Tammy Bollet, and next up will be Peggy Wilson. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy Bollet, and I graduated from Santa Barbara City College. 
California is now 35th out of 50 states in education. Less than a third of our fourth graders are proficient in math and reading. One third of our Californians are on welfare, and that budget is 103 billion of our state budget. California is now home to 134,000 homeless people, and many of the immigrants who migrate to here have no high school education. 66.4 billion of the 170 billion dollar state budget goes to education, and 302 billion is in unfunded public pension liabilities. 31% of the residents in California are paying 100% of the taxes, the top 1% now paying 40%. The Board of Trustees used its position of authority to preach bigotry and hatred towards a country that takes the most refugees of any nation, gives the most money, physical and human labor around the globe. Every nation around the globe and throughout history has, a, has had a history of racism and oppression. The surest way to end up back in the dark pages of history is through a lack of education and political indoctrination, where religion is removed and God-given rights excised from the public square. Of all the issues confronting public universities today, the attack on the lack of freedom of speech, religion, and the free exchange of ideas should be paramount. Atheists are incorrect on the intent of separation of church and state. Thomas Jefferson hoped to avoid theocracies such as the reign of the Catholic Church in Europe, but felt that speech and religion and the freedom thereof were intricately intertwined. The professors in Santa Barbara are well paid. They have health care, they have pensions. 20 you, seconds remaining. You have now left the taxpayers with $136 billion in unfunded liabilities. That's privilege. University professors live on our hard work, spew hatred towards white race, sow division and hatred among our students. That's not education. Jesus said, I will remove the stick in my eye if you remove the log in yours. As a graduate of Santa Barbara City College, I am greatly disappointed in your lack of support of a nation that has over the years supported you in so many ways. I'm tired. I am very tired of hearing about white privilege in our universities, and frankly, maybe it's time to stop funding you because you really don't appreciate it and brats need to go home. Okay. You, you, might, re, you might recall that I said before we started public comments that we weren't going to have interruptions by noise or speaking, whatever. So I really would humbly request that you not clap during speaker comments. Thank you. Next speaker is Peggy um, Wilson. No, I'm Linda Bonet. Um, we kind of got mixed up here. But I'm a native Santa Barbaran, and I aim in what just the speaker before me. And I will add to that um, that there's a lot of anti-Americanism taught, anti-Christianism taught, if that's a word, and anti-Semitism. And those, those three things are very disturbing to all of us. Um, I'm here to represent a gentleman who just turned 95 years old uh, two days ago. His name is Lou Bass. I've known him my entire life. Um, my father, Newell Bonnet, met him when they were both enlisting in World War II in early 1942. And um, they, were, they enlisted in the Marine Corps as aviators. They both uh, were served in the Pacific Theater um, against the Japanese. And um, Lou was shot down uh, in the Pacific Theater, and fortunately for him, his band of brothers were able to rescue him. Um, and, and he also served with my father in Korea. Uh, and my father was shot down in Korea, and the same thing happened. He was rescued by his other patriots serving as well. But Lou went on to serve in Vietnam uh, also. And I honor anybody here who served uh, in any of the wars, even back to World War II. Oh my gosh, I'm almost done. Um, and I want to stand with Lou Bass and Celeste and most of the people here against um, the audacious and arbitrary and unauthorized actions of, of Mr. Robert M Miller. And um, we hope, we know you can do better than this. Thank you. And Peggy Wilson, are you Peggy? Yes, okay. I am. Yeah. 
Yeah. Next up is uh, Lori <clears throat> Puches. Punches. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Peggy Wilson. I'm a native of California, and I've resided in Santa Barbara, California, for the past 50 years. I'm a former student at Santa Barbara City College and have a great love for the institution at Santa Barbara City College. Thank you, trustees, for the public service you perform to steward the college and listen to public comments. I'm very appreciative of your efforts. Two weeks ago, local and national news zeroed in on Santa Barbara, California, particularly Santa Barbara City College, over a controversy involving the unilateral decision by newly elected SBCC Board Trustee President Robert Miller to not recite the Pledge of Allegiance at SBCC Trustee Board meetings. In his email to Celeste Barber, Mr. Miller states, and I quote, I assume full responsibility for the decision not to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And a little further on, I quote, I have discovered that the Pledge of Allegiance has a history steeped in expressions of nativism and white nationalism. While I understand Mr. Miller has his personal opinions, I think it extremely devious that he would use his trustee president position to further his own personal political agenda. This is evidenced by the fact that Mr. Miller acted on his own accord and failed to involve others in his decision. Furthermore, a true leader in the best interest of Santa Barbara City College, its students, you and the community, remaining. thank you, would welcome the opinions of other board members before making a decision not to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Symbolically, the pledge and flag is near and dear to many of us and at the very heart of being Americans. This unilateral decision leaves no doubt in my mind that Mr. Miller is not qualified to be SBCC board trustee president and I call for his resignation. I have a few more minutes, uh, one second. With liberty and justice for all, those words from the Pledge of Allegiance do not belong to a particular party, a particular race, creed, or ethnicity. The Pledge of Allegiance belongs to all Americans and it symbolizes unity, solidarity, and agreement that we are one nation under God, America. Thank you. Next speaker is Lori Punches, and up next is Gloria Buchek. Hi, my name is Lori Punches. I ran for uh, Santa Barbara Community College Board of Trustees this last fall and uh, for Kate's position, and I really loved getting to know all of you during the debates and the forums. But I have to tell you, I'm really disappointed. When, when I was a little kid, um, you know, we always said the Pledge of Allegiance. I was dyslexic, and I couldn't figure out east, west, and north, and south, but I knew where the flag was. I always knew where the flag was every single grade I went into, and I took a lot of solace in putting my hand over my heart and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, when I was uh, in third grade, I got my wisdom teeth pulled. Actually, it was sixth grade, I'm sorry, wisdom teeth pulled. And I remember the one thing I did is I just said, for God and my country. <laughs> you know, I just believe that the United States of America is founded on some very, very basic principles. And I just want to read to you the Declaration of Independence. Because um, when I watched on YouTube what happened to Celeste Barber, who was just an instructor for 20 years of English in Santa Barbara City College, what really ripped me up and what didn't just disappoint or embarrass me, um, it made me ashamed of the board, is that none of you stood up with her and said the Pledge of Allegiance. And I was going to join you. I'm, I'm sad. But I want to read you this, and this is why I'm standing up here. On the Declaration of Independence, it says this, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the public bands which connect them and assume powers separate and equal to the laws of nature and God's nature entitles them to decent respect to the opinions. 30 seconds remaining. We hold these, these truths to be self-evident. When all men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator, their creator, they're with certain unalienable rights. These are the life and liberty and pursuit of happiness. When a long train of abuses reduces them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide guards for their future security, which is what we're doing here for Santa Barbara City College students. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Gloria Buchek, and next up will be Celeste Barber. Thank you to the board for allowing us to have this period to speak. 
I'm very happy not to see a bunch of students hanging around with big signs behind you. I too was very unhappy with what I saw at that meeting. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Santa Barbara. I've been a teacher, businesswoman, I'm a parent and a patriot. And I'd just like to ask a question. We've had many wonderful comments, but I ask, what is it that binds us together? Most of us are immigrants, grandchildren of immigrants, and have come here from someplace else. We come from different countries, different governments, different histories, different races, different ethnicities, different religious patterns. But we come here and we call ourselves Americans. Well, what makes us an American? Well, to me, an American is being a citizen of these United States. It is a country that grew from the dreams of common men and women to one day be free from lives determined by caste, religious affiliation, accident of birth on a social ladder, or some other form of predestination. And for centuries, the common man had dreamed of a place of freedom and opportunity where he or she could pursue his or her own dreams and ambitions. These dreams were given life on this continent by some very special people who shared a vision of liberty for everyone that would come here and of just responsible self-government. So to that end, they created a constitution and bill of rights that is unparalleled the in history. seconds remaining. And they hoped that future generations would defend and protect the new republic and the founding documents. The American flag represents our founding, our constitution, our bill of rights, our best ideals, and the sacrifices of so many who died to defend them and us. Choosing to remove the pledge of the flag that is the symbol of our republic and all that we stand for is a grave mistake. It shows a misunderstanding of what the flag represents to Americans. We know our history isn't perfect but we also know that we strive for a more perfect union with liberty and justice for all, and we recommit ourselves to that every time we say that in a public place. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Celeste Barber, and next up will be Michael Aaron Woody. Um, my name is Celeste Barber, and I'm pretty certain everybody knows where I stand on the Pledge of Allegiance. I would first like to say, though, I'm wearing a remembrance poppy today, and that's in honor of our precious veterans who are standing here with us today. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for that. Um, when I was thinking about what I would say today, it occurred to me that there's really one primary underlying reason why we freely recite the pledge in this country, and that's because we love and feel a devotion for this country. That's why we recite the pledge. There's another word for those kinds of people. They're called patriots. All of you sitting up there are patriots. Everyone who's filled this auditorium today is a patriot. And that's why we recite our pledge, because we love this country so much. It's precious to us. I would also like to add one other thing. Of all the countries in the world, past and present, there is no other country that is more deserving of its patriots than America. And I would just like to say on Valentine's Day, I love you, America. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Michael Aaron Woody. And next up will be Grace Wallace. Uh, my name is Woody Wilde. I'm a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Army. I'm for the flag. I salute the flag. Most of my comments will be personal. During my 20 years of service in the U.S. Army, I <clears throat> first went to Korea, went just after the fighting stopped there, and then I went twice to Vietnam and served my country. That's 20 years in my lifetime, my family's lifetime, spent in the service of the country, and the flag is a big part of that. I'd like to read a very brief statement by General Omar Bradley, one of the five-star generals of World War II. General Omar Bradley argues that the attacks on crosses 
like the attacks on our flag, must be fought. He notes in brief to the Supreme Court that among other things, he is the recipient of not only the Medal of Honor, but this distinguished service cross and six distinguished flying crosses, all in the shape of a cross. These arguments that we have about the flag and the pledge are all connected, and we need to be defending these symbols of our patriotism. You have 30 seconds remaining. I find uh, nothing in this pledge that is white nationalism or racist. Grace Williams, no, Grace Wallace, are you here, Grace? And next up will be uh, Denise Spangler Adams. I'm not sure that I am next because my name is Grace Wildy and I heard Wallace. It says Wallace, Grace Wallace? It says Grace Wallace, is there a Grace Wallace here? Okay, so please go I ahead. I believe she spoke uh, very early on. First of all, I'm delighted that so many people here have stood up and said the things that are in my heart. I came to this country under a, from a dictator in Guatemala. I also lived in Spain under a dictator in, Guatem in uh, Spain. My husband served for 20 years, and so did my four children, as well as I did. And we moved 20 times in those 17 years. What I'm trying to say is there was a lot of sacrifice that went into protecting what we are right now uh, arguing. I am appalled because after hearing all this, I could feel my temperature rise that Mr. Miller had actually gone in name-calling. I always, when I've taught um, conflict resolution, you always start with, I feel, not you did this and you did that. And here you have, it's racism, it's white nationalism, and it's divisiveness. That divisiveness is something I did not see in those 20 years in the military. We lived all together, whatever race we had, were. We went to chapels. We either didn't or didn't go. You know, it was a choice. And I, actually, I'm afraid for what's happening now. I'm 86 years old now, and I never thought that I would see people pitted against one another by color. 20 seconds remaining. And so I'm more afraid of what all of you are doing by taking this stance. You didn't vote for it or anything. You arbitrarily now have become, a, in my estimation, an autocrat, someone that believes that you have it all right. You don't. So please consider the sacrifice, because freedom is not free. I've seen more division in the last five years, and I don't blame it on Trump either. Time's up. The divisiveness is political. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to ask everybody, we'll get through this uh, sooner, we'll be able to hear everybody. Uh, hear them all clearly if we don't clap either during or after their comments. So if you could help us with that. I'd... So the, the next speaker is uh, Denise uh, Spangler Adams and next up will be uh, Linda Bonnet. Before I start, I wanted to ask a technical question. You had said you were taking general public comment before you took comments on the flag. I, my understanding on procedural grounds was that you were having two public comment sessions. I had cleared that with your attorney, Craig Price of Griffith and Thornburg. Let the record show that the 
trustees are being represented by Griffin and Thornburg at this meeting, and I was told you had two public comments. I also want to put on the record for Mr. Miller that I view it an act of discrimination that when you had people there that were aligned with your social agenda, you gave every speaker five minutes, even though they, I had to sit through them holding a sign for five minutes and saying absolutely nothing. And I have been to your meetings. I also want to thank Jonathan today for standing for the flag. I noticed last week you sat for the flag. And I, apparently you play, you're a politician, you play to your audience, you got an audience today. So I'm watching my clock. And that's my procedural questions, and hopefully your attorney can respond. And another point of order. Excuse me. That's a point of order. Excuse me. I, I will respond to your, to your comment. We, we have public comment right now. This public comment Stop period. Stop the clock, please. This comment period, your comment period, this comment period will be immediately followed by a consideration of the resolution concerning the Pledge of Allegiance. So we're having one comment period, and that comment period is right now. Okay, well, your attorney told me there would be two. I have a general comment slip in for demographics about the Immigration Act of 1965 and how it changed America and how we need to unite it. I have a general comment slip in for that, and I have a second general comment slip in for the flag. You allowed five minutes for the other speakers. I expect to be given five minutes like them. If, in fact, you choose to have two minutes, then I expect you to coordinate with your attorney before a meeting to clarify what the ground rules are, because I play by the rules. You have 30 seconds remaining. So in my final 30 seconds, I will tell you the goal is to unite. I think you all collectively should be ashamed of yourself for your behavior at past meetings. I think, Jonathan, you should Give us an explanation for why when there's a crowd you stand for the pledge and you don't otherwise. I'm the great granddaughter of the man who carried the flag for the battles of Gettysburg and Antietam. People died. Abraham Lincoln's birthday was celebrated on Tuesday. I hope you will read the Gettysburg Address and what it stands for. I hope you will understand what America is and I hope you will learn to appreciate you would not be sitting up there if it wasn't for all of us. Next speaker is Jeff Paley. Jeff Paley. And next up after Jeff would be uh, uh, Jadine Robles Wright. So, can, can, can I have uh, counsel address the comments about the public comment periods? I'd, I'd be happy to do that, Mr. President. First of all, I just heard uh, someone shout out point of order from the crowd, and um, as the case may be, in a meeting such as this, points of order are only allowed to be taken or exercised by members of your board. But in response to Ms. Adams' comments, she is correct, and as you know, on every agenda, you have ordinarily first an item that allows the public to comment on issues that are not otherwise on the agenda. And I know that today, because so many speakers are here to talk about the pledge, that it was determined to take the public comments on the pledge so that those people could be heard first and not cause to have to wait and to delay, and so that is my understanding regarding the public commenters that you're taking now, and of course, subsequently in the meeting, you will be allowing public comments, one comment on a non-agenda item per speaker uh, uh, that people wish to express. So I hope that clarifies the situation. Excuse me. Ex ex excuse me. Okay, we're going to proceed. We're, if, if you could. I'm asking for public and I'm asking for the audience to sit down and listen to the speakers who will now continue. Thank you.
Do you wish to take a brief recess so that we can um, attempt to serve the member of the audience? If not, then please go ahead and proceed. And when you get to a recess, we'll deal with the issue that's being raised. And as Chairman Miller indicated, there should not be any shout outs or disruptions as the speakers proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Please. Okay, I would ask you to please. What I'm saying is silent. that the president is about to indicate that by your continuing to speak up, with all due respect, you are out of order, and we're going to attempt to deal with your issue when the board takes a break. So please let all of these people who are here to speak make their comments. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, please proceed. My name is Jeff Paley, and uh, I must confess that when I first heard about this, I. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, when I first hold, hold just hold one minute while we reset sure. the clock. I won't take. Too okay, long. I'm sorry. I Go won't ahead. take too long. Uh, I just must confess that when I first heard about this, I, I a bunch of question, questions came to my mind, like where, where where did this idea of eliminating the Pledge of Allegiance come from? It's been with me for all my life, and it's never been a problem. Uh, was somebody offended by it? Uh, is, this, is this a high priority item among the members of the board of uh, the board uh, here? Is, aren't there more important things to, to do than this, this the Pledge of Allegiance? And so I, I just feel like uh, it's, my, my whole way I operate in life is uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I, and I, did the board feel that the Pledge of Allegiance was something broken that needed to be fixed? And those are my comments. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Janine Robles Wright is next, and follow up will be Linda C. Seal, looks like. So are those is, speakers here? Is Janine Robles Wright here? Okay. Janine Robles Wright. Okay, Janine Robles Wright, are you here? No. Linda Seal. And next up, Gary Villalba. Villalba. Okay. Okay. Please Good proceed. afternoon. My name is Linda Seals. I uh, live above uh, City College. I am a retired attorney with uh, a Santa Barbara County Council's office. I'm a senior deputy, and uh, I've sat in on a lot of board meetings and advised a lot of board meetings and done what uh, your attorney has done. I am here to speak about what happened last week related to the pledge. I never thought I'd see something like that happen in Santa Barbara. I uh, received a, a question about it from someone on the other side of the country. I just checked today, over four million people have looked at that scene uh, where Celeste was speaking and was interrupted. And I'm just embarrassing, it is embarrassing for us. I'm very practical, and I'm asking that you board, as a board, take a look at what happened and take a look at the, what's happening to the students. When the students feel strongly enough that they have enough power and authority over you that they can get behind you and try and intimidate you and bully you, I think you need to look at what they're being taught. I need to think you need to look at the teachers who are there supporting this and encouraging it. They, um, when kids stomp and when they kids try to speak over you, they're usually five years old. And then they usually get it time out. So it's very disturbing to see not only the kids, and I'm calling them kids because they are kids. They have no life experience, it shows. But the thing is, this is supposed to be the transition between the families and real life. And real life's not going to put up with that. 
They're not going to get jobs. They're going to have a lot of problems in life if you don't set those standards higher and not allow the kids to think that the school belongs to them. It does not. It belongs to taxpayers. It belongs to the people whose names are on the buildings. It belongs to the people who are there teaching. With the, without all of the money that you come in and all up. of the grants that you, they have available to them, they wouldn't be here. Thank you. Jeff Paley is the next speaker, and after that, Gary Vialba. Okay, then Gary Vialba. It's Gary Vialba. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm David. a proud uh, sixth generation Santa Barbara, and I graduated from Santa Barbara City College in June 1965, and also UCSB. And I was very proud to serve in the U.S. Army for three years during the Vietnam War. And in respect to my brothers and sisters that served in country, I served in the Republic of China, Taiwan, in the support capacity. I would like to inform you and make sure you understand that the Pledge of Allegiance is codified by federal law. It's the United States Code, Title IV, Chapter 1, Section 4, the pledge and the manner of delivery. And I do have a copy of that for you. I'll leave it on that table as I leave. For the last 10 years, my broken heart, for the last 10 years and currently going on today in this country, our country is besieged by an attack on the rule of law, on our institutions yes. and our sacred traditions, yes. absolutely under a sale. And a lot of it comes from academia, from a compliant press, and a certain political party. And I will simply say to you today, this will be brief, if the Pledge of Allegiance to this great country, the greatest country in the history of mankind, the most prosperous and the most generous, if the Pledge of Allegiance is somehow offensive to you or obscene, I respectfully request that you step down from your position as a board member. Thank you. Next speaker, David Madar. David Madajan. I'm going to ask one more time that we not have comments, clapping, shouting, cheering from the crowd while we have speakers. We'll get through this a lot sooner and hear from everybody if you can abide by that rule. Thank you. The speaker is David Madajan, and the next up will be Haptis Sibon. I'll try to be very bad so you won't be tempted to clap. I'm uh, David Madajan. I'm a 35-year engineer with Raytheon, probably best known in town as being a sc scout master. I just was very shocked. Well, I also admit that I'm a little bit right of center. But I'm so shocked to, at the comments you made and how far to the left the board is. I, I believe in diversity. I don't care what gender or color people are, but you need diversity of opinion on that board. I can't believe that no one on the board resisted your edict to discontinue the Pledge of Allegiance, and that it took a retired adjunct professor who bravely came forward and challenged you. We need a, a board that reflects our community and reflects our diversity. You need some conservative voices on your board. I don't care if you resign and make a space for someone to head the board, but you need to mix it up a little bit. This is ridiculous. That's all I have to say. Forrest Woody Wild is next. Okay. Uh, Betsy Rapp, is it Clans or Cleans? Cleary, okay. And I'm sorry, what is your name? Hap D. Simone, you called me. Oh, okay, good. All right. Well, thanks for hearing me. Uh, I'm probably the only person here that's going to speak in your behalf. I support your action up to a point. If uh, the people in this audience that painted the flag, at least the red part, offends you, uh, I don't have a problem with it. If my blood bothers you, the red part of the flag, it doesn't bother me that it bothers you. Something bothers me. I'm a teacher, parents' teachers, taught in the Army. 
we all went to City College. My sons were taught there that Richard Nixon was responsible for the war. Kind of thought you had somewhat of a jurisdiction over what the teachers did. My uh, son also wrote in English class an essay. Pick a topic, get on one side or the other. He picked a topic on gun control. He was against gun control. He got a D. So I said, Peter, you screwed up. I want to see that. I didn't see any criticisms of his grammar on the whole thing. It was beautifully written, but it was the wrong thing. It was the wrong side to be on. So I think I need to say to you that the middle of the far, far left isn't the middle. And if the teachers, professors wish to be on the far, far left, it's perfectly acceptable to do that, but I won't protect and defend that as much as I'd rather protect and just defend the flag. So as board members, again, thanks for hearing me, but consider middle of far, far left isn't the middle. That's right. That's Betsy Rapp Cleary and followed by Leanne Simando. I love my country. I'm an army brat. My dad served four and a half years of my life in Vietnam, two tours, one in Korea. Long ago, I memorized something, and this is all that came to me, and so I'm going to say it from, and it was a song that we used to be able to sing over the, it would come on the airwaves, preamble of the United States. If you know it, you can say it with me. We the people, in order to form a more perfect human, establish justice and secure the, ensure the, Ensure the domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and ensure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Our pledge is a symbol of our republic and all that it stands for. It is not racist. I, when I was in fourth grade, I was one of five kids in an all-black school. I moved 23 times before I turned 18. I love my country. My brother, two-star general, has served under Doug. He was right on to General Petraeus. We've watched what's gone on in this nation. It's just the saddest thing to my heart that you people have chosen to believe the lie. Yes. The lie from the pit of hell. Yes. This country is founded on freedom founded on God, and I stand behind her with all my blood in my body. Thank you. Leanne Simandl, and followed by James Finkner. Thank you for letting us speak today in a safe place, in an orderly place. I've been, my family's been here since 1953, I graduated also from City College, so did my son, and I'm also a teacher. I have a vested interest in our community schools. And I was alarmed when the pledge had been banned from public meetings. We encourage pride in our families. There's a lot of pride in individual heritages, our city, our college. We have fight songs and mottos, and not our country. The country which gives us more freedom has, has been stated than any other. No one's forced to say it, but you want to prevent us from affirming liberty and justice for all. That's very curious to me. Santa Barbara City College vision says you want to create a socially conscious community where knowledge and respect empower individuals. Your core principles include free exchange of ideas across a diversity of learners, and there is no longer any diversity. And when there is diversity, it's often shouted down and put down or not invited to speak in a, on our campuses. I don't think eliminating the pledge accomplishes any of your goals there. Last month's meeting on this subject disrespected diverse ideas and the community that supports this college. I encourage the board to model respect 
for our freedoms. We are teachers, as was said, and for diverse ideas, including appropriate patriotism, by permanently reinstating the pledge. I encourage you to model free and open exchange of ideas by maintaining order, by creating a safe environment as you did today. Respect and learning do not occur when students are allowed to disrupt meetings and mock individuals with whom they disagree, or when a group is allowed to dominate the room with signs without even participating in any of the discussion. I hope that future Santa Barbara City College draws national attention because her students have learned to bring respect and order to the free exchange of ideas represented in our great country. Thank you. James Fenker, followed by Tony Kredovsky. Yeah, before I begin, I just want on this Valentine's Day, I tell you, um, all of these speakers, I absolutely want you to be my Valentine. This is so much wonderful love. Um, my name is James Fenkner, and for the last decade, my wife and I have contributed um, significant money to the uh, SBCC Foundation. President Miller, I question your fitness to be a SBCC trustee, much less lead it. The pledge is not, as many speakers have mentioned, racist, nativist, or white nationalist. Where you have gotten that vile revisionist poison and why you are unable to expel it with rational, critical thought is anyone's guess. Let me provide the cliff notes. The pledge's 31 words are a cultural touchstone of American ideal. They pay homage to the enormous sacrifices made. The pledge is an aspirational message for everyone's future to form an even more perfect union. Mr. Miller, I don't request that you slide, recite the pledge yourself. There's not a pop quiz. You don't have to say the words. It's not compelled speech. I ask only that the pledge not be banished so that others are free to stand up, put their hands over their heart, and say it with dignity and love. My final thoughts. If a publicly funded academic institution cannot protect the fundamental freedom of speech and ensure, as others have mentioned, diversity of thought. I really don't know what business you're in. Whatever you're doing in formatting division and discontent, I, for one, have no interest in subsidizing it. Thank you. Next speaker is Tony Krajowski and followed by Dennis Peterson. Uh, this is addressed to the board and to Mr. Miller. Uh, there is nothing in the pledge that is racist or white privilege. Uh, I am white, okay? I don't, have, I don't think I have privilege. You tell me what special advantage, right, or benefit I have over any other person in class, since you call me so privileged. Also, I am not a racist, but you tell me how I discriminated or think I'm superior over another person. When or where did I do these things? Do you have any answers? No. No, you don't. You can't. You, but you throw out this radical leftist garbage of yours. It's pure hate speech. It's, put, it's pitting one group against another. Uh, how can you classify all whites with privilege and racism? Also, uh, now I understand there's a new privilege. Asians now are, are privileged. Who's next on your list? M Mr. Miller, on his first meeting of the board, wanted to get rid of the pledge. He couldn't wait to tell uh, America all about white privilege and white racism. Mr. Miller, you're a hardcore leftist hater. City College deserves a better leader. Mr. Miller should be uh, uh, fired. We want a leader to bring us together and, and, and not separate us. Please keep the pledge. Thank you. Dennis Peterson, 
followed by Louise McCaig. An attempt to remove a vital First Amendment right from a public meeting with social justice warriors is now passed. Sanity has been restored, and for that I thank the full board. The flag is very important to all of us, always. Let me give you two sentences and explain where we're going here. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming. Think about those two sentences. We're talking about night and day and things are going on. The British are shooting cannonballs at us for over 24 hours straight. And that flag never went down once, not once. But wait a minute. Cannonballs are big. They kick out flagpoles. What held it up? The people held it up. We held it up. That's what happened. And we're not going to forget that. British weren't happy. They couldn't take the place. All right. There was hardly a gap in the view. Uh, it's amazing. We have earned that right to speak freely by this symbol that reminds us of it. Our flag and our pledge reaffirms the events of September the 13th, 1814. Regardless, the flag was there. And today, I and my friends will pledge once again our allegiance to the republic for which it stands. Thank you. Louise McCaig, followed by Judy Whiting. Hi. My, family, my mother's family immigrated from Mexico in the early 1900s, and my father's side of the family from northern Italy, in the, also in the early 1900s. My family has been in Santa Barbara since 1914. I brought a bunch of pictures because if anybody ever wanted to know how much some parts or many parts of the world really want to come to the United States, become citizens, work hard, be in coal mines, work, be from Italy and work in chorizo factories, um, all the different things that be poor, you know, nobody can't, my family didn't come here rich. They came here to become Americans. I grew up in a home where they spoke, some members spoke Spanish, Italian, and English. And we all blended, we, um, it's an important part of being here. And we're proud to be Americans we didn't let go of our heritage, but we blended in with this one. Glad to be here. Thank you. Judy Whiting, followed by Jubilee Tang. I'm a native Santa Barbarian. I uh, was born many years ago at Cottage Hospital. And I am shocked. And the education system was always very good here in Santa Barbara. Recently, however, History's been rewritten in California. Uh, the uh, schools have gone down in national standings. The academic learning of the students has gone down. And now we are taking apart the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. My family, all the men in my family, my husband, all of my brothers <coughs> served in the military, and they respected it. They respected the flag, they ex respected the Pledge of Allegiance, and it is in no way racist or detrimental to anyone. It is a spirit of unity and patriotism. And to say that the Pledge of Allegiance should not happen with your board I find repellent. This is not right. Hate is not something that should be taught in schools. Respect is something that should be taught in schools and seems to be sadly lacking. And I suggest that you think about where your salaries come from. They come from hardworking people who pay taxes. 
and those taxes pay your salaries. Yet we are considered bad white people or bad patriots, and the Pledge of Allegiance is not appreciated, and therefore you don't feel you have to say it. Please reinstate the pledge and stand up for America. Jubilee Tang is next, followed by Joe Danley. Dear uh, Board of Trustees, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I wasn't planning at all to speak, but um, I feel really privileged to speak because I'm in this land of freedom, of religion and speech. I was born in Taiwan. I moved to Indonesia when I was four and a half, lived there for 10 years, came to the US for high school, and I, you know, I was very privileged to put my hand over my heart and pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States because it guarantees freedom for all, equal freedom for all, liberty and justice for all. When I was in Indonesia, just by walking on the streets, I was hit up, you know, I was actually hit physically by people who were different color than I was. I lived in the homes, in the home, and I had to listen to Muslim whatever every morning, how many times a day, but we had no rights to do anything. But the United States Constitution, uh, because it's so strong, the U.S. is the hot, strongest nation in the country. So I'm not here to be emotional, left versus right, this and that. We just need to realize the facts that what is guaranteed under the Constitution is liberty and justice for all. Whether you like it or not, it's one nation under God, and that's what's been provided for all of us. So we're very grateful. Even to have this meeting right here, it's because you have a strong Constitution. So regardless of your views, the Constitution is here and we have to respect it. Thank you. Joe Danley, followed by Mike Cleary. Members of the board, uh, my name is Joe Danley, and I've lived on the Mesa for 45 years. And in that 45 years, I have really seen a lot of changes at Santa Barbara City College. However, I never, ever thought that I would read of the decision to eliminate the pledge uh, that prompted this meeting. I am an Army veteran. <clears throat> I served under that flag <clears throat> for five years. Actually, I fought under it for two. And I do not think the pledge represents nativism or white nationalism at all. Now I know and I've known people of many races and ethnicities who are proud to salute our flag and recite the pledge. And I'm not just talking about veterans groups. Even the local chapter of the Antique Automobile Club of America asks me as a veteran to lead the pledge at every monthly meeting. And believe me, I'm very proud to do so. Now, <clears throat> we know that no one's required to recite the pledge. And although I'm proud to stand and say the pledge, those who prefer to sit on their hands are certainly within their rights to do so. I have no quarrel with that. However, I do think that most Americans strongly support reciting the Pledge of Allegiance at public meetings and gatherings. 30 seconds remain. And therefore, I would request that it be made a permanent part of the board's agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Cleary is next, followed by Julie Bischoff. It's popular today in some circles to say that we are not an exceptional country. We are an exceptional country, an extremely exceptional country. After World War II and where we lost hundreds of thousands of people and wounded millions more, what did we do? Something no country has ever done before. 
we reached out to our beaten foes and lifted them up by the bootstraps with the Marshall Plan. That is exceptionalism beyond all belief. We loaned them billions of dollars, and as I remember, only one country ever paid us back, the Netherlands. On another thought, I noticed that politicians are very happy on every strike, from Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump to George, to uh, uh, Mr. Roosevelt, anybody. They, when they are campaigning, campaigning, pardon me, always have a flag behind them. It sets a proper tone, they think. I never saw your your campaigns, if there were one. But afterwards, when the bullets start to fly, figuratively or imaginally or real, maybe they don't stand next to it quite so close. I think that having the Pledge of Allegiance 20 seconds in your meeting sets a tone that you are standing by that flag, that exceptional country that hundreds of thousands have given their lives to protect. I think that the gentleman who graduated in 1991, I don't know his name, gave an exceptional performance. The true meaning of that pledge. Thank you to him wherever he is. Thank you. Julie Bischoff, followed by uh, Douglas Scott. Board of Trustees, thank you very much for allowing us to come here today and speak. Uh, most people have already said what I had already written, so I'm going to delve into something very personal to me. My parents gave me and my brother a gift. A gift of two people that they sponsored in 1957, refugees from Hungary, from my aunt and uncle to be, I learned about communism. I learned that they left Hungary when the Russians invaded. They gave up everything to be here. They became U.S. citizens. My, they moved in with us. I didn't know what I was pledging about when I was a little girl, but I learned. I honored them. My uncle helped put the moon buggy on the moon. Neither one of them spoke English when they came here, but boy, did they understand what this country was about. I would like to ask you if all of the students who go to City College would be willing to die for our right to speak, our right of free speech, as so many in this room are willing remain. to do. If they are not being taught how precious our country is, how much it needs protecting, our Constitution and Bill of Rights are unique. There are other democracies in the world, but they are not like ours. I ask you to respect and to educate everyone on what this country truly is. Thank you. Thank you. Douglas Scott, followed by Grace Wild. Douglas Scott, the principles contained in our Pledge of Allegiance and our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, are what make us an exceptional country. Our God-given rights and ideals, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill, <clears throat> thou shalt not, shalt not commit adultery or bear false witness, those are enshrined in our laws and our mores as a people. There are many countries around the world where life is cheap, where women are second-class citizens, where you are guilty till proven innocent. Uh, 
those are the things that make this an exceptional country. If our young people aren't learning these lessons, I think it's a failure of our education system. Yes. Yes. You are responsible for educating these young people. And, and I think that if you don't uh, believe in these principles, uh, I, I, I just don't think you should be on a board of a public body. Thank you. Thank you. Grace Wild. Is Grace Wild here? Oh, okay. William Brunner to be followed by Dave Bramson. William Brunner. Followed by Dave Bramson. Good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, it's my opinion that there's a hidden agenda in all this. And I think it's the further removal of any mention of God in the public square. Looking back through the pages of the nation's past, one truth becomes obviously clear. Historically, God cannot be separated from America. The first settlement established on the shores of New England in the 17th century, the Plymouth Colony, based their governing document, the Mayflower Compact, on the God Almighty in no uncertain terms. Generations onward, when the colonies could no longer bear the yoke of the mother country, these 13 colonies came together and agreed as one to be separated from England. The spirit of 76 produced the Declaration of Independence. Any reading of that document clearly shows an acknowledgement of God. The nation was forged in the crucible of revolution, in the darkest days of that struggle. In the Snow Valley Forge, the general of the army knelt down and prayed to God, asking for strength, success, and victory. The framers of our Constitution, almost without exception in their various writings, acknowledge God. The writings of the Founding Fathers re reveal they were people of faith and did not hide their convictions. These few examples do not even amount to a foothill in the mountain of evidence of deity being in our institutions. The day will come where we all will be standing in front of the Creator, at which point some can explain to him in person why he doesn't exist. Others of us will bow down and express our gratitude for his hand upon America and thank him for the blessings he has showered upon this nation. Thank you. Dave Bramson is next, followed by Marion Shapiro. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering, this is heavy stuff. Do I have time for a 20-second antidote that'll cheer us up? Okay. My Youngest son out there, girlfriend, who goes to City College, uh, she, uh, her, they have a six, she has a six-year-old adopted younger brother, and he said, do you say the Pledge of Allegiance in your City College classes? And she said, no, we don't. And he said, well, that's not a real school. <laughs> All right, now, carrying on. This is an educational thing. We're gonna learn an acronym today, KHA. is an acronym. It's gonna per put into perspective how most of our public college uh, boards and directors operate out of a certain set uh, framework of perspective, KHA. Robert Miller's job would be best performed by deleting biases that label a traditional, uh, a foundational tradition like the Pledge of Allegiance as something perverse. The Pledge of Allegiance fosters camaraderie and reminds us that community liberty and justice have made the U.S. a great nation that millions are desperate to enter. Nothing is gained by such tactics. They are destructive and breed conflict. But Mr. Miller's left empowers, is empowered by this. The US left is well defined by this acronym, KHA, which means keep hate alive. They attach false negatives to their opponents and attack institutions like the pledge based on some sin of the past that is totally irrelevant today. Good Americans, no good Americans embrace or tolerate hateful attitudes out of the past or now. But Miller's left won't let that go. They are fueled by KHA, keep hate alive. 
They oppose speech that counters the ide their ideology. 30 seconds remaining. To invent nasty accusations about a press tradition based on some past aberration only prov proves the KHA acronym, Keep Hate Alive. Falsely labeling the pledge as perverse is not the action of a trustee whose job definition to set aside personal feelings and protect the property of his constituents. Denigrating the pledge is petulant and causes disruption based on a false premise. It is KHA. Keep hate alive. I just encourage uh, Trustee Miller to um, that that uh, you can. Um, uh, the pledge does not establish religion and does not violate Amendment Number One. So tolerate it. Remember tolerance. It does not disparage anyone. Demeaning it is much more. But to you, it can be just historical. Don't be destructive for a false premise. Be tolerant. Thank you. Marion Shapiro is next, followed by John Church. Marion, are you here? John? John Church would be next, followed by Ann Sprecher. Ann Sprecher is next. Thank you uh, for allowing me to speak here, and I'm, I hope this is being filmed to be shown to all the young people of what's going on here today. And I wanted to uh, say that I, I'm, I'm a command sergeant major, retired. I've been in Iraq, Bosnia, and many places. But when I was a young soldier, naive, teenager, coming out of Santa Barbara, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for my basic training in 1964. And uh, on our way home to Santa Barbara, we were all wearing the same uniform. And we got off to eat at a restaurant, and they would not serve the black soldier. All of us, to a man, got back on that bus, and we refused to establish or, or go in that establishment. And the reason we did is because we were now all Americans under this flag that we pledge allegiance to and that an injustice will be dealt with as it was in the 60s. And um, the, the, the flag that we have today is all our cultures, all our religions, and all of us woven. It's the fabric of our life. And it holds us all together. It unites us together and 30 seconds remaining okay and I would hope the board would keep the pledge uh, of the allegiance and um, and not listened to that white guy or whoever he was the racist person who wouldn't serve the soldiers that's an anomaly and I think that what's happening is kind of the same thing in a different way. So thank you for listening to me, and God bless America. Thank you. And Sprecher is next, followed by our last speaker, unless I have somebody else in the other pile, uh, Raina Solomon. I'm Anne Sprecher. I sort of feel like I'm here from another planet. But the first thing I'd like to thank is Dr. Miller for the job he's doing and all the board members. President Beebe, I think you're doing a great job. And I'd like to remind the audience, if they actually believe in democracy, that all of these people were elected freely by the community. They were not appointed, and they're not here for money or glory. So thank you. And. I was made to say the Pledge of Allegiance from kindergarten to seventh grade, and I suddenly started to question what it was. It was meaningless being forced to say something. And when I switched schools, instead of saying the Pledge of Allegiance, we actually studied civics. And I believe this is an educational facility. It's an institution to teach. It is not military. It is not a Congress. It is not here to pass laws. And we should really pick our battles and think about why we say the Pledge of Allegiance. It probably doesn't need to be said here. What we might need to say here is our mission cause. It would be far more appropriate. The world is not going to fall apart 
people are not going to become godless and hate the country because they don't say the Pledge of Allegiance. People are free to say it if they want to. It's right here. So thank you, and let us continue to be an educational institution, not a political and dividing one. Thank you. And finally, Raina Solomon. Raina? Hello, thank you for listening. Um, I just wanted to say, just side note, your voice reminds me of, you know that old talk show, Password? Was it Password? Like, I want to hear him say, the password is. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, thank you for listening. I love you. You're not alone. All words of declaration. When you love someone, what do you do? You declare it. Outwardly, I love you. There's powers in the words we declare, and we declare the things that matter to us. We hold these truths to be self-evident. I have a dream. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United Unified States for every citizen of America, and to the Republic. Well, what is the Republic? It's our home, for which it stands, one nation under God. And the Bible says that God is love. So under God, you are declaring one nation under love, declaring that there's more to life than just what we can see in this day, today. Indivisible, undivided, unified, standing strong together with liberty, freedom to be who God has created you to be in your uniqueness. Then justice for all, justice for, justice for who? Whether you're black, Asian, white, Native American, Latina, Eastern, um, Eastern Indian, LGBTQ, young or old, our Pledge of Allegiance declares all these things, all these things we hold true to our hearts as Americans. If we remove this Pledge of Allegiance, we say we do not believe in those things. We say we do not stand for those things here in Santa Barbara, 30 seconds our community. Remaining. We pledge allegiance to this flag. The Bible says that God is love. So what do you say? Do you want a nation of love? Do you stand for those, your brothers and sisters, of every background, of every walk of life? I do. We stand as one nation under God, and we proclaim it, and we declare it out of our mouths, just like you declare, I love you, I'm with you, you're not alone. I pledge allegiance that we are one nation under God. Did I miss someone who wanted to speak on this issue? Did you fill out a uh, slip? Yes, sir, I did. Okay, what's your name? My name is Gary Vandeman. Thank you for allowing okay. us to speak today. Uh, discrimination by race, by skin color, not acceptable. It's not acceptable with prefixes or suffixes. Not acceptable being pro or con. Not within our human race. We are one race, many colors. The white only soda fountains are history. Good riddance. But somehow it's become okay to have black only words. For some reason, enunciating the word nigger is okay if my skin is dark enough. Discrimination in any context is divisive and wrong. My goal is to have equality of opportunity, equality in everything. Thank you. So do you want, Mr. Chairman, do you want to take up the resolution first, or shall we go to the other? Well, if you have a, did you? Your call. Go ahead, please. My name is John Buchek. Um, calling about, uh, I'm talking about the meaning of a flag. What is the flag? It's a symbol. It's not meaningless, it's meaningful. You might think of the iconic image out of World War II, Mount Suribachi, Iwo Jima. Soldiers struggling to carry up the American flag. That has meaning. That's what we are, our culture. Just some background <clears throat> that we can all relate to. I grew up in Chicago when it was a crazy quilt of ethnic communities. It was not a big city. 
lot of little communities, signage in all different languages. And we competed one with another. We came together when we went to high school. Because there you had people, different ethnic backgrounds coming together and we identified with our high school, playing football, playing basketball, playing baseball. The symbol, the school flag, was a unifying element. We were all together. That's what the flag does for us. And I'd like to uh, bring up a painting, a copy of which I just got, by an artist called Schwartz. He spells his last name, capital A-R-T-Z. 30 seconds remaining. Yes, he writes, he paints on American flags with the vertical stripes down. You have a sailing ship, sails full blown, leaving a harbor, this choppy water, turbulent water. In the background, hazy is the skyline of a city, maybe New York City. The title of that painting is called Hope. And that's, that boat is sailing from its culture, back on, into the future, through all this troubled waters. And that's where we are right now. That's all I want to say. Thank you. OK, we move to uh, general topics that are not on the agenda. Let me check with council first. So council. The council. I would recommend that you complete this agenda item regarding the pledge, meaning to take up the resolution which is before you, and only after that then uh, take comments that are, are I think we should. I'm very sorry, that's the recommendation. The comments have been made on an agenda item. You are taking up the agenda item at this time. My recommendation, if you choose to follow it, is to finish the agenda item before moving on. It, we will call on, we will, excuse me, we will call all the rest of the speakers who filled out speaker forms as soon as we go through the resolution on the, on the agenda. Yep, so, so, thank, thank you, if you could please, we're now going to take up the Pledge of Allegiance resolution. We will now turn to item 4.1. You're going to take vote on it before you let other people speak. Point of order, please. Okay. 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 Okay.
Um, and it, it, it makes it hard for me to even move forward with this discussion of the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, so I would appreciate if we take a recess now, but I, I think that there are a number of us on the board that would feel that way. Um, and I just, I don't think we can let that kind of speech slide by. Yeah, we'll I, I just have to say, the fact that Crystal was gaveled but not that gentleman is very offensive. We need, we, we need, we can't keep going right now. We're going to take a recess right now. Trust, Trustee Miller, before. We're, we're on a, Trustee sorry, Miller. we're on a recess right now. Five minutes? How long? Five.
Be seated. So I, I, I think, and I'll, I'll take uh, my share of blame for this, I think there's been some confusion about what order we're doing uh, items tonight. But what we're going to do now is we're going to go, we have uh, 18 speakers who have submitted slips. We're going to uh, continue and finish with all those speakers before we uh, go back to the, uh, the, the pledge resolution. So if we could call those uh, speakers, Trustee Haslin. The first speaker, B.J. Weiss, followed by Carol Teton Lantis. B.J. Weiss, are you here? Mr. Weiss, could you raise your hand if you're here? Uh, Gail Teton Landis, are you here? Okay, I'll start her. Keep going. Okay. Sherry Holland, are you here? Is Sherry Holland here? Okay. John Busek, Buczek, sorry. Mr. Buczek. Okay, who's next? Chris Norton, N-O-R-D-I-N. Okay, I saw a hand raised back there, Mr. Norton. Followed by Linda Seals. She's only speaking. Yeah, this is for general public. Hello, uh, I am a former student and community member. Uh, I have no advocacy for the pledge either way. I'm here to support uh, the students who protested. Uh, the return of the work to work of Ms. Moss uh, and the board's uh, response to those actions, which I feel were inadequate and tone deaf. Uh, attending SBCC uh, allow, or allowed me to attend university and succeed in op opportunities that would otherwise be available for me, and I'm extremely grateful for that. During my years here, I was able to gain valuable skills and lifelong friendships. Growing up in the nearby neighborhood, I was always thought of SPCC as something to aspire to. You're where I wanted to go when I was little. Uh, so um, I thought of you as a destination even, even before I knew what I was going to do beyond that. So in short, your institution really means a great deal to me. My experience uh, was inspiring and rewarding, but it was not universal. I felt safe, included, and free free to pursue my goals at the number one community college in the nation. But that is not the case for all students, especially students of color. Many black students have come to this board and told them of their experiences of racism. They need action. I want them to have the same experience as I had. They deserve that. This president and board of trustees have continually demonstrated that they lack the will to make substantive strides towards that goal. I want an SBCC that doesn't just take credit for being welcoming and supportive of a diverse student body, but that actually delivers on training. that promise. Oh, um, I would like the, uh, the ombudsman to be a person that is appointed, should be approved by as many campus constituents as possible uh, with a track record of pursuing restorative justice so that complainants can trust in them and they know they'll be a, a good faith advocate. If you, if you appoint someone who is a neutral party, it's just going to reinforce the status quo and the students can't trust that and it will just make your job easier. And we need better than that. You can do better than that. Thank you. Linda Seals is next, and then Gail Teton Landis has returned. We're going along with the two minute rule that we've been following. There'll be 20 minutes at least by the time we're done. At least 20 minutes. Yes. Excuse, excuse us, please. Excuse us, please. Please. Please sit down. Out of order, please sit down. Linda Seals. Yes. I'll start, I will, please don't start the clock until I have the floor. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Linda Seals. I'm an attorney, retired from Santa Barbara County Council, and I put in two slips, one for general comment and one for the issue on the pledge. 
And what I wanted to say here is that what we're seeing earlier, although the students are upset, they need to understand that their behavior is being watched by lots of people, people who are investing, people who have chosen not to go to the fundraiser in April for that the foundation is having because they'll give their money to, uh, to UCSB or to another college, another place where they feel like that you, they're getting a better education and they're not allowing the students to run things because they are here, the students are here to learn, they're to be educated. We want them to enjoy their experience here, but not to turn this into a free-for-all. And it's embarrassing and for the people who say they're not going to subsidize any more of this, um, you've got to think about that. What's going to happen to the school? Where are these kids going to go to school if the school can't withstand all of this? So I'm being very practical in saying, think about what you're doing, educate these kids how they should be protesting, have some self-control and act with some maturity, tell the teachers to do the same thing because we can't have instructors screaming, yelling, pounding, acting like little kids and then expect that the public, the public who wants to give donations of a million dollars and more to help these kids to get a good education decide to give their money to Westmont. That's the concern that I have. The image of the school is right out there, and we don't want to have people get the wrong impression just because of a dozen kids who, don't, who think that they have the right to disrupt things. Thank you. Gail Teton Landis is next, followed by Gage Englander. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so I've been hearing about sort of unrest about um, uh, the students and uh, what happened with the, s the staff member and I just feel like there's been months and months that have passed and I think at last coming up with an idea of our, 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 a way to bridge this issue and satisfy students and faculty and staff is wonderful and I support the Ammons program and um, I just think it's taken a really long time and what we're seeing is students who feel that they haven't been heard, and I just think their frustration is boiling over, and I kind of don't blame them because I think they feel like no one's heard them. And so I um, am happy that at long last um, there's some action being taken. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next speaker. Next speaker is uh, uh, Cage Englander, and followed by Gary Vander Vanderman. Hello, so my name is Kay Jinglinder. I am a 16-year-old middle college student on campus, and for everyone here saying there are only old conservatives here, I would like to say that that is wrong. I am a 16-year-old conservative Jewish person, which in the intersectional hierarchy makes me about the same level as a slave owner, apparently. So I'd like to say as much as people may think that because of my race and my quote-unquote lack of systematic oppression put against me that my points are invalid, that that's ludicrous. Everyone seems to struggle, everyone seems to struggle in their own form. The only form of struggle that should matter is that which is on a personal level, not that which you believe society has put upon you. You're at a free college giving you a free education. Quite frankly, I'd say if anything, it's left of center, and if anything, it's promoting your ideals more than it's hindering it. A teacher, Lindsay Moss, made a stupid choice of words at an equity conference. She was out for your own good, and she misspoke and said something that I will admit was foolish and dumb. She should not have said that. But that's all it was. It was a misspeak. It was nothing more, nothing less. So for you guys to come up here and act like you've seen the horrors of life and act like you've seen oppression, just know that you're not helping your case. Struggle is something like when I had to come to CC four days after my dad died, transitioning from a standard high school. That's struggle on an individual level. Name one time a teacher or anyone has come up to you because of your race. I doubt ever. And if they have, they should be fired. If someone comes up to you and bullies you for your race on campus, they should be kicked off campus. 30 seconds remaining. But I believe that's already campus policy. Because if someone bullies you, they're jerks. That's what they are. So I'd like to leave with one quote. If you keep your child in a clean room his entire childhood, 
When he leaves, the common cold will kill him. All you're doing is making students that are ill-prepared for real life, making students that are ill-prepared for opposition in an echo chamber in a state that's already the epitome of an echo chamber. So by removing the pledge and humoring these intersectional fallacies, you're not helping them. You're, you're ruining them. Right. <laughs> Gary Vanderman, is he here? He no, no, has already spoken. Okay. Uh, Barbara Parment, followed by Cressida Silvers. Cressida Silvers follows Barbara. Is Cressida here? Okay, good. I would like to yield my time. Oh, we don't. We don't allow. We don't allow yielding of time. I'm sorry. You 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 allowed a lot of speakers in order. So I'm, I'm sorry. Speak. I read that. Do not gavel me, Robert. Do not gavel me. I've had enough of the gavel. You, I'm done with the gavel. You're out of order. I'm not out of order. You let all these speakers go out of order. You let people come when their names weren't even being called, so you can let her yield her time. We had to sit through all of those speakers, with, hear all of that racism. You can start the you're, clock. You're out of talking. order. Please call the next speaker. No. Somebody say something. You let all those people come up and talk when their names weren't being called. Okay. Next speaker. You are you are out of order. So you're gonna do this, Robert, today yes. with yes, all I this am. racism talk we're talking yes. about, with all the injustices of black students, the very reason why I'm not on that board anymore, because I was gaveled and pushed out, the very reason why I dropped out of SPCC, because I was pushed out as a black woman, the very well I was sexually harassed at SPCC and nobody cared and I was pushed out and you're gonna gavel me and you let everybody speak. You are out of order. I'm out of order. Yes, you are. And none of you are out of order ever. Never out of order, and you're disrespectful too. Thank you. Arrogance, you're racist. I think you've now had your two minutes you, in any event. All so. of you coming here today. Do you know how hard it is? Do any of you even know how long ago you've been to SBCC? Do you know the hardships that students face today at SBCC? Do you do anything at that school to help low, low income, disenfranchised, underrepresented students at that school? Do you know you're what you face? at that school, you don't know Do I hear a motion? because you don't care. Do I hear a motion to declare her out of order? I'm out of order, really. But you let all the other speakers speak. This is what my people have had to do for you. We have had to protest. MLK was a radical. He Mr. Had to President, if we I may. Yes, Mr. Mr. President, if I may. The correct procedure. We had to protest. We had to keep talking. The correct procedure, having determined that the speaker is out of order, is to warn the speaker that unless she immediately ceases, you will entertain a motion to have her removed. That is in accordance with your rules, and you have given her adequate warning. I, do I hear? Point of order, you have been ruled out of order. Do I hear a motion? Do I hear a motion to declare the speaker out of order? I make a motion. Is there a second? Okay. Is there any discussion on the motion? We have a motion to declare the speaker out of order. All those, all those in favor, say aye. Trustee aye. Miller, aye. Can, we have can we just discuss this for a moment? Yeah, sorry, Trustee Parker. Um, what I would like to note is that while we don't yield the floor to other speakers, that we have been, I've noted during this meeting, that we have been allowing other speaker slips to come forward. So it would have been very simple for her to add her name to the speaker list. Um, I don't know if she wants to do that at this point, but when a meeting gets this disruptive and we can't go on, we need to stop. Um, and so I don't know if we need to rule one person uh, uh, to have them removed or just simply paused to give that person a little time to leave. Um, you know, that's something that we could do as well. I, 
I think the speaker at this point has, uh, has removed herself to the rear of the... No. Excuse me. I, I just don't understand what's so hard about saying, speak, turn in the slip after, turn in the slip right now, you can speak. Like, why get confrontational with someone who wants to address us? I, I agree with you, Crystal. I agree, and I, but I think it's very simple and just good for the community to just let her speak, let her turn in the form. It will harm no one. It will harm no one. Yeah. Any other discussion on the motion? Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. All those against? No. No. Okay. Motion passes. Next speaker is uh, Chrisita Silvers. Who follows? And uh, Costos, um, I'm trying to remain, read the Ak Akin, Akin Volos. Oh, Akrivolos. Ah, okay. Let's follow that. Followed by uh, Dennis Brand. Okay, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Cressida Silvers. I'm not affiliated with the college, but I am a resident of Santa Barbara County and a constituent. In reviewing the coverage of recent campus happenings and watching previous board meetings, I've seen student after student, along with faculty and staff members, meeting after meeting, come to you all in genuine distress to tell you about the consistent hostilities they face walking through campus, going to the library, registering for classes, and even in class. I can only imagine how difficult it is to be on campus and to focus on your studies under these circumstances on top of the usual stresses of academic life. I would like to think the college is interested in supporting its students uh, in providing a positive learning environment for all to set up its students and the college as a whole for success. Yet, as far as I can tell, there has been no genuine investigation to address these original complaints from your students and employees. Whether this apparent lack of response is due to obliviousness or ineptitude or to lack of transparency or whether it is intentional to distract, thwart, and intimidate Whatever it is, it sends the message that the affected students, staff, and faculty are not valued members of the college community and that they don't merit consideration or protection. And that's just not right. And it signals to me as a parent and a community member that maybe this institution isn't such a great option in which to entrust our college-bound loved ones. So I urge you to go back, back past the tangential distractions that have developed and really address the original complaints about a hostile racial atmosphere and specific race-based incidences around campus. So I support the request of black students, staff, faculty, and their allies for an outside independent entity to address harassment and discrimination grievances, including those the college was alerted to back in November. Furthermore, in order to be effective, this outside person or agency must be chosen with input from the affected student, staff, and faculty. Otherwise, it just won't work. Okay. And it risks becoming yet another source of division, disappointment, if, if and you could wrap, wrap up. Thank you. on campus. Thank you. Costos. Next speaker. Acrivolos, followed by Dennis Brand. Hi, my name is Costa Sacrivolis. I'm a Santa Barbara resident and close friend with members of the SBCC community. I've been con concerned about how people of color have been treated on campus, especially over the last couple months. I'm here to support the two simple and reasonable requests made by SBCC students, faculty, and staff of color and their allies. First, there needs to be an external review board or ombudsperson to process complaints and grievances of discrimination and harassment at SBCC. This is necessary due to a pattern of lack of follow through from the administration. Also, to be clear, the obvious person must be selected in consultation with impacted students, faculty, and staff on campus. Selecting someone who is not approved by the groups making the demands, such as the obvious person on today's agenda, is not an acceptable response. Second, there needs to be meaningful anti racism training for all employees and a long term campus wide anti-racism plan must be instituted at SBCC. 
This means training for not just a subset of employees, but all of them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Dennis Brands, followed by Scott Ruskland. Hi, I'm a member of the Santa Barbara community, and I value our community college. From a community college, I went on to get a graduate degree, and I hope this path continues to be available to any student who wants to learn. However, I'm disappointed in the direction City College has chosen to take, where it seems the college is failing to provide a safe, inclusive environment for all students. When, for example, the administration fails to take seriously complaints that some students can't study in the library without being subjected to racial slurs, it shows that the administration is not protecting students' physical safety or emotional well-being. It's worries like this that have caused several of my friends with children to plan on sending their children elsewhere. One thing that would indicate to me that the administration is making a good faith effort to protect all students would be to hire an ombudsperson experienced in working with students from diverse backgrounds. The CV of one person being considered for this position is sadly lacking in this area. To consider someone without experience in the specific issue facing the school shows either a lack of understanding of the issue or a refusal to take it seriously. I also want to echo the um, calls for input from students affected in the hiring of the ombudsperson. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Ruskamp, followed by uh, Mary Turley. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Scott Ruskamp. Um, I'm a Santa Barbara resident. I've taken classes at, at SBCC. Um, I'm close to a lot of members of the SBCC community. Uh, I have the privilege to be close to um, including members of the members of color. Um, I have been concerned about how people of color have been treated on campus, especially recently. Um, I'm a member of the local Surge chapter. Surge is showing up for racial justice, and we have a Santa Barbara chapter. Uh, one of the things that's important to Surge is accountability to the people who are affected by racism, people of color. So that means that we need to listen to and um, take the lead from people of color when they're brave enough to, to take the lead and speak up, um, like Crystal, the, the young woman who just spoke up in front of us. So I'm here to support the two simple and reasonable requests being made by the SBCC students, faculty, staff of color. First, there needs to be external review board or ombudsperson to process complaints and grievances. Again, this is due to the pattern, the lack of follow through from administration. The ombudsperson must be selected in consultation with impacted students. You need to listen to and take the lead from the people who are impacted by racism. Selecting someone who's not approved by the groups, who you decide for the groups what you think is best, that's, that's not an acceptable solution. You have 10 seconds and left. Second, there needs to be meaningful anti-racism training for all employees and a long-term campus-wide anti-racism plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Mary Turley. Mary. Thank Turley. you for the opportunity to speak. Um, Followed by keep, Simone. I'm going to keep my um, comments short. And I've also sent um, the board, uh, the trustee members, and Dr. Beebe um, a, a longer piece of information with a lot of information today by email. And I did not have student trustee Kenny Igbechi's email, so if you guys, somebody could route that to Kenny, I would appreciate it. So um, I am a longtime resident of Santa Barbara. I want to thank Dr. Beebe for all the wonderful work he's done in the time that he's been in the college. I wish you all the best with regaining health and healing. I'm pleased to see the college refocus on the needs of local students and their success, the creation of the Promise Program funded by SBCC Foundation, the improvements to increase the transfer success rates and programs which provide education and training for local students which also benefit local employers. The idea of offering more night classes seems promising as a way to help students balance employment while furthering their education. So there's a lot more that I attached. I'm just going to read a basic outline. 
um, in regards to student housing based on my review of video meetings. Um, housing is complicated. We have a tight housing market with a low vacancy rate along the south coast. Hence, housing is very expensive here. Santa Barbara is a beautiful area. People want to live here. We don't have to promote it. The Mesa is gorgeous, very desirable, close to SBCC. No need to promote this specific neighborhood over others for student living. Others areas have great benefits as well. Rents are higher on the Mesa. Rents are lower in other areas, further from the campus, with markedly better services and still accessible to public transportation. The entire region and the college needs to po focus on better transport options. Um, city is working on affordable housing. State is working on affordable housing. Um, work with the city and the county on housing and promote um, students living in other areas of Santa Barbara. Please do not rule out the support of a zoning overlay to help preserve neighborhoods and, and, and housing and consider, uh, continue to focus on the students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Simone, followed by Paige Miller. So I wasn't planning on speaking. As you could probably see on the slip, I was going to try to give my time to someone else. But I have been so moved by the amount of hatred and anti-blackness that this board has allowed that I figured I would use my time. So I want to be very clear. These people here are a distraction. You, as the board, know that black students came to you in November talking about multiple incidences of harassment and discrimination on campus. Some of you even came to meet with black students. You said you were listening. You watched them cry, and you did nothing. Then at the last board meeting, three women come and talk about their personal stories and you're swift in adjusting? If we're going to talk about veterans, then we should also talk about the fact that people of color, particularly black and brown people, are overrepresented in our armed forces. We should also talk about that when those people come back to this country that they almost sacrificed their lives for, that they are not welcome, probably by some of the people who are sitting here in this audience. And then the fact that you would try to problematize a black student who trusted you with her story multiple times when you did not ask to remove a man who shared a racial slur is despicable. What are you going to do for our black students? And why do we continually have to come here risking our jobs, risking our safety for you to care about our black students? Why? Why? Why do you continually want us to beg? Paige Miller. followed by Anna Reed. I actually came here today because the ombudsman was supposed to be here, or a potential talk about the ombuds office. And I felt really strongly about that because I'm part-time faculty at SBCC. There are almost no full-time minority faculty at SBCC, I will point out. But I also am a researcher at UCSB. I have my doctorate, and I work in molecular biology. At the first meeting where I ever spoke, it was after these issues began, and it was not to you, but it was to the Senate. And I have to say, they certainly um, seemed to respond to all of the comments people were making. And that was in November. And nothing has happened. Nothing has been done. And now we have a room full of people talking for two hours about an issue that doesn't even really exist as a problem for our community at SBCC. It was a crisis created by a poor decision unilaterally made by a man who apparently doesn't understand how to talk to anybody else on the committee he's on before he does something that might lead to bad repercussions. 
And then you want to know why our students might not feel safe on our campus. Who can they go to and talk to and expect to listen to them? We have leaders who don't talk to remain. us. We have leaders who don't respect us. We have leaders who have heard our stories and have heard people crying. I actually have no negative experiences at SBCC. But I hear the stories from my students. I hear the plea for help, and I am crying. And you people are doing nothing to actively help them. I don't care about your plans for the future. What are you going to do today? You're putting them through another trauma. You have allowed these people to assume that students were the problem at that meeting and that students of color had anything to do with the decision to remove the pledge. They had nothing to do with it. Nothing. They were never asked. They never said they were concerned about the Pledge of Allegiance being said. Never. They came to a board meeting because they wanted to silently protest the lack of response you have had toward them. And instead, they, you let people believe that they were yelling things at a woman who chose to talk about the pledge. They were not yelling. I will I'm tell sorry, you people, our students never said anything about the pledge in that meeting. It was a faculty member who was in the audience who was yelling at that woman. It was not any young person of color or otherwise who was irresponsibly interacting with that person. Time is up. Our students have respectfully Please attempted to speaker. communicate with this board for and months and they won't listen to us. They've never had a meeting for us where we all got to sit here and talk for two hours about our feelings. Nobody is listening. Nobody is you're out of me. order. I know you're out of order too because you are not serving please, our community. Please sit Why down. are you creating problems instead of helping us? I am. I have I've never been so in Reed, my life with the Reed, people who are supposed to be responsible. And Do you I can't read this next one. I think it's Denise. Please all of sit us. down. If you you're fail out of minority order. Minority community, you fail us all because we are supposed to be one community at City College. I've worked there for 10 years believing that, and in the last year, you have destroyed uh, my faith in this yeah, institution. I think, uh, and it disgusts me that you would let these people come here and have two I'm hours trying to, to talk read you this. and it not looks like listen to our students. You Delise, are people Delise, who make me ashamed just to be first point of order. and to work for you. I, I am sorry yes. that Second. you cannot open up Trustee your Miller, hearts and order to let your have a, procedures we have a to call the speaker out of order. So, Elliot, is next to speak. If you continue to not listen to us because I'm not following your procedural rules, your Darcy. rules are garbage. They are a way of keeping us from freely speaking and speakers. being heard. You are using your rules to protect yourself from the truth. You can hide behind that nice lawn table with your pretty suits on and listen to these okay. people tell you over and over how hurt I have a motion to call the speaker on order. to do with our city college students. Point of order, I move to, to remove the speaker. You don't want to hear I hear a us. second. I know it. You would rather have us thrown out of the room. a second. Yeah, I'll second. Not Robert a second. Miller, you should have taken responsibility. We came to you and asked, and all you did was have BB and There was a motion and a second, Ed, Mr. You President. You should apologize I didn't hear to a these second. students. Trustee Miller. We, Any trustee has one second. We, I would appreciate an apology to the students as we requested. Is there a discussion on the motion? I believe we had a second. Okay. No discussion. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Darcel Elliott, followed by Ray. I think it's posthum or? Point of order, Trustee Miller, you do need to do the no's. Let's hear the no's. No. 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 Okay. There are two no's. Is so, Ray here, the, have, our final speaker? Okay. Okay. Oh, good. Speaker, please proceed. Um, so I actually came here tonight to, to thank President Miller for putting the Ombuds program um, on the agenda for discussion and to thank Trustees Haslin and Croninger for the work that they did on the ad hoc committee on um, gender equity, sexual harassment, and conversations on difficult subjects. Um, I'm totally heartbroken by what I've seen tonight. This is, this is just devastating for our community. Um, and, I, and I acknowledge that most of you on that board did not get elected to deal with systemic racism, but 
you're an elected leader and people expect leadership in times of crisis from their elected leaders. And the Ombuds program is only the beginning. Um, you know, meaningful racism work, and, and we're talking about, when we say that, we're talking about not just sitting in a classroom, hearing someone speak for a while, and then checking a box saying you did a training, but real racism work, real mediation to try to heal what's going on on this campus. About, and, and I think that this board needs to show some true leadership and what is acceptable on this campus. And I know that some of you are going to say, well, there's people on both sides. There's freedom. Some people say freedom of speech. Some people say hate speech. Um, but this isn't a left or right issue. There's just something that is just the right thing to do. And I just ask you to look in your values and look in for the students and see the students here today crying before you, begging you to do something. And just try to listen to them. And don't just take action based on what you think is right, but really listen to them and hear what they need and try to take action there. Thank you. Denise, I think this must be your... We have one speaker here. Well, your, your name, please. Yeah, I, um, I thought I heard you mention that we could speak if we hadn't put in a speaker slip and submit a speaker slip later, as apparently the man who made the did offensive you, comments had done. Did you submit a speaker slip? I did not. Okay. Yeah. Then we should we should go to the next speaker on the who has a slip. And I think that's that is Denise. It it was my understanding that the last speaker who made the offensive comments spoke without a speaker slip. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. So, will you take speakers now or no? Well, as, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, speaker slips need to be submitted at the start of the meeting, and we even gave extra time for people to do that. She's, well, she submitted a second slip, so she has a right to speak on so different topics. If we, but if we could ask you to yield the microphone okay. to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Annette Cordero and trustees. I did fill, fill out two speaker slips. I want the public record to show that the sheriff in attendance has stated that he refuses to keep any order to the meeting unless it's called for by the Chairman Miller. He said that there would be no citizen's arrest or no procedural judgment calls unless it was moved and Please seconded the by clock. the board. So I wanted you to know that. Second, for the record, I want to know the clock has not been run on other people giving public comment. Third, I want the record to reflect that Griffin and Thornburg is the attorney of record today for the trustees, the same attorneys that will be going to federal court next week to represent Santa Barbara Unified School District against just communities, uh, or, or if, uh, with just communities against the community at large who is fareducation.org. It appears to us that there is a definite conflict of interest. The reason why your meetings can go in complete disarray is because of the conflict of interest of Griffin and Thornburg representing both parties. If you're involved in a federal lawsuit on one side for the social justice warriors, some of us call them because they are unruly at your meetings, then it is difficult, excuse me, I have the floor, it is difficult to represent the college, and I would think that you would look, know that as people of law, but that's an ethical issue. Third, I wanted to point out that the speaker who spoke to you, the biology teacher who overstepped her time by about five minutes, she has written into the channels and public comment that she would be embarrassed to work for City College. Her public comments have been reviewed. Please allow the speaker to continue. The clock is not stopped. May I stop. say that every time that I am interrupted, the clock needs to stop. You have 30 she seconds, over, but we'll give you no, some. No, I'm sorry. I, excuse, I, I, excuse me. We'll give you extra me, time. Excuse me, Mr. Miller. You're doing dual standards. I'm sorry. We will give you extra time at the end. Please continue. Thank you. I want you to know she's on the public record that she would be embarrassed to work at City College for the behavior of the college. 
Thirdly, I want, or fourthly, whatever the number is now, I can't keep track, Annette Cordero did approach me during your recess to ask me to say that we do not know each other. Her son mentored my son, and I think this has become big business, big business, and I want you to know that ideas will take over our college, Ide ideas will take over our city, ideas will take over our country, and it's time you have said as trustees you would get a neutral party you begin an extra done time it. please wrap it up sorry but see i'm leaving but they stay you allow them to stay and you, you, you won't mean, call order okay your time is up thank you When was this submitted? Here's the request. Here's what? Is there a net Cordero? Yes. Yes. If you could, if you could uh, continue. Okay. Thank you. I just want to clarify that once again, um, Denise Adams is, mis is misrepresenting the truth. Um, I did not tell her that we don't know each other. We obviously do. She used to come to every board meeting to complain about something. Um, so uh, we do know each other. I asked her to stop saying that she knows my opinions on various issues when she does not. Um, so Excuse me, uh, I wanted to just comment here that um, we are here repeatedly, meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, to try to get this board to respond to the issue of racism. Okay. Clearly, there are people who don't want you to do that, and so they've manufactured an issue around the flag flute. Um, but the issue really is, and has been for months, the issue of racism on our campus, and has been for years, I might add. Um, this is not the first time that students have been harassed because of racist incidents that have happened toward them. Not that they have committed. They are getting harassed because of behavior, the racist behavior of others. When we had, and many of you remember this, when we had the TP issue a few years ago, Native students were called out in their classroom by their teachers in front of the entire class. When that was reported, absolutely nothing was done. And one of the primary students who was facing this retaliation was told to stop complaining. Um, so when you, if you need nuts and bolts, which I don't really think you do, because every single one of you knows that what we're saying is true. The 20 seconds left. Um, but if you, think you need nuts and, if you think you need those facts, you have them. You know what they are. And I might add, listen to your student trustee, because he is giving you that information. And there's a reason he sits on that board, and it's because the college needs the voice of students. Um, I also want to just remind you, you up, that I will, that it is shocking how many of the people who just stood here and professed a devotion to the words liberty and justice for all are perfectly happy to see that not applied to people of color. Okay. That's all the speaker slips we have. I don't mean to be on the order, sir, but I think Chris slipped in. Well, we, if, we, if we missed it, we'll and you, tell us you submitted a slip, we'll let you speak. Well, look. Yeah, yeah please just apply the rules equally. Let's get the slip. His name's Kyle. And you, do you remember is it from Kyle? Uh, democracy is messy, have you noticed? I don't. Yeah, I know. 
Going as quickly as I can here, folks. And, and I think We're going to allow you to go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Kyle Rasmussen. I work at City College. I'm a veteran of the United States. I represent the veteran students on our campus. And we had no idea that the Pledge of Allegiance was said at the committees. Uh, we were shocked that this was an issue that came about. Um, I serve about 300 students altogether, and these students spread across right to left and down the center. They are more shocked at the fact that there's been no accountability by our higher powers than anything else. These men and women have fought for your country. They followed rules and regulations. What they said and the actions that they did were held accountable to them. You are allowing staff on our campus to incite, to raise people up in a way that they see fit on both sides. These students of mine don't feel safe enough to speak on campus anymore. They have teachers asking them what they think about this. They fear that their bias is going to now be affected by their grade. Take this into account. The 30 seconds remaining. They are our students, too. You are letting our student body down by not addressing these fundamental issues that have been raised by our student body on campus. I would be amiss if I did not mention their voices here today because I told them not to come because it would not look good for us. But I want to speak out for them because it's your fault. It's your words and your actions that have caused this issue. Thank you. OK, we will now turn to item 4.1, the Pledge of Allegiance resolution. We just say by introduction that Dr. Beebe and several board members, including myself, decided this item should be on today's agenda for board action. I support the resolution. I have not changed my views on the pledge, but the interest of the college comes first. The controversy has been an unwelcome distraction from our primary goal to educate students and maximize their chances for success. Thus, I welcome board consideration of the resolution, which I will now read. Whereas Santa Barbara City College is one of 114 publicly funded community colleges in California, whereas the California community college system was created to provide educational opportunities for residents of all ages and beliefs without discrimination against protected classes and with attention to the educational needs of the communities where they are located and to disadvantaged students residing there. Whereas education through teaching and learning is the primary focus of the college, including as a core principle the free exchange of ideas across a diversity of learners, as well as the teaching of critical thinking and respectful discourse without political or ideological preference. Whereas historically, since at least 1959, the Pledge of Allegiance was not included at Board of Trustees meetings, Whereas a request for change to add the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of board meeting was made by a local resident in July uh, 2018, and thereafter the pledge was added, and then later removed from the board agenda, 
both decisions without a discussion or decision by the full board or public input, whereas since the board members have received further comments from the campus, community members, and others, and the board recognizes and acknowledges that differing views have been expressed. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the agenda for the governing board of the Santa Barbara Community College District will include recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance unless and until a majority of the board determines otherwise pursuant to an agenda item at a noticed public meeting after public comment and resolved that the Pledge of Allegiance is voluntary and no person attending the board meeting is required to state the Pledge of Allegiance and passed and adopted by the Board of Trustees of the Santa Barbara Community College District this 14th day of February 2019. Do I hear a motion to adopt the resolution? Can we have discussion for this? First, there's a motion and then a second and then a discussion. Okay. First, is there a motion? I move to approve resolution number eight, addition of the Pledge of Allegiance to board meetings. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there discussion? Okay. Trustee Mackey. Um, Mr. President, Board of Trustee, um, I would just love to say here that none of the students whom I represent on this board no student who goes to SBCC was involved in the removal of the Pledge of Allegiance. I think it's important that we tell the general public that, and I want to use this platform to inform the good people of Santa Barbara that none of the students were involved in the removal of the Pledge of Allegiance. Our students are not un American. We are taught to have free speech. We are allowed to think freely. And none of my teachers have graded me wrongly for thinking in any way I want to think. Racial laws are not allowed at SBCC. And it is sad that it was said here. We are taught to be better leaders. And really, most of, our, most of the people we look up to are failing us right now by telling us that the racial laws is OK to drop at any public meeting. It is sad, and this is not a good example for the students who I present on this board. The Pledge of Allegiance represents noble sentiment and celebrates noble, um, celebrate shared values. And we are not against it. We are not against America because we know that the veterans fought for, for us to be able to learn under a safe environment, and we're not against it. So please, I just want to let the public know, the Pledge of Allegiance wasn't removed by students or any students at Santa Barbara City College. We're not involved. None of, none, none of the black students or the white students or the black or the brown students were involved in the removal of the Pledge of Allegiance. Also, the Pledge of Allegiance represents very little of the problem we face at City College. Many of our students go to classes hungry. Many of our students don't know where the next rent is going to come out from. Those are the issues that, that are affecting many of our students. And it's sad that the board is not really, it's not just restating the Pledge of Allegiance, but there's a resolution on the table to make it permanent. This is not the issue that affects students. Many of our students right now are homeless. Many don't know where the next food is going to come out from. That is the problem we face at City College. Thank you all for coming out. We need your support. Please join us. Join us and support our students. They need you. Thank you for coming out. We need the same energy to fight food insecurity in our, in our campus. We need the same energy to fight housing insecurity in our campus. We need your donations, please. Our students are not un-American. I am speaking for them because they cannot all be here. But please and please, our students are not un-American and they love going to school. But there are issues on our campus that we need to help us fight. Thank you. Any other, any other comments? Is it my turn? President Miller? Trustee Abu. Cool. Thank you. I usually speak pretty quickly, but I'm going to slow it down a little bit. It's a little difficult making this statement, especially hearing so many of the toxic comments as a person of color and first generation American. It's not been easy to listen to some of the things said. I want to express my shame uh, that the, not the last speaker, but the last speaker in the previous session before the 
recess, uh, said the N-word in a derogatory manner, and I didn't hear a single person who came up here and espoused how great America was and justice for all didn't say a thing, and only two board members did. And so I have a shame for that. And just hearing it said like that so blasé really shook me, and then it, the, the board silencing a black woman once again made it clear that white supremacy is alive and well in Santa Barbara. I, I want to start by reiterating very clearly that this is a resolution to add the pledge after it hasn't been on for 60, 70 years. Uh, it's not to remove it. And that, we're not removing the pledge, we're adding the pledge with this resolution. And that's, we've never had it before and we're, we're adding it because three people asked us to. On the contrast, dozens and dozens and countless people have asked us to take action on the issues of racism and sexism and xenophobia on our campus, and I have yet to see action on the board level, as much as I'm trying. Uh, and I want to clarify that those issues that we've experienced and not dealt with as a board since last March are in no way tied to the pledge issue. Those happen at the same meeting, but they have nothing to do with each other, and I really want to say that not for myself, but for how the press has conflated the two, how Many speakers have conflated the two, and I want to, like Kenny, really clear this issue up that the people who care about the pledge and that issue are literally a separate silo, a different place than the people who are coming and telling us that this college needs to better serve students of color. We need to be way more engaged and serious about the issues our students of color, our women, our LGBTQ students face. Not this one, this is a distraction. Those are the issues that really actually matter. Those are the issues that I got elected to solve. I, I, we're told student success is the number one goal of the board. This has nothing to do with student success. Most people speaking in favor aren't students. Most of the people who've spoken in favor in the past for action from the board were students, were faculty, were staff. They see the day-to-day, -day, they experience the day-to-day, -day, and we need to take that more seriously. We need to do way more. Um, I'm really just disappointed that a lot of the people who came up and said liberty and justice for all and how great our country were is uh, didn't say a thing to make SBCC better at accomplishing the goal of liberty and justice for all. Like I heard nothing from a single speaker who said yes on the pledge. They didn't say anything about cleaning up the issues at SBCC or anywhere, and so that that, in, many of the speakers spoke in a manner that actually engenders a non-inclusive culture for our p students of color. Um, and having said that, you know, when I get, once again, I want to acknowledge that this is a new addition to our agenda. New. For 60, 70 years, this is the first time we're going to be actually putting it on. And I want the board to really critically examine this and think about it, because that's what our mission says to do. And it's like, why are we putting it on? Are we, what, is, what purpose is it serving? What goal is it accomplishing? Why not a different introduction? We, I mean, we got by without doing it. Other governments do it, others don't do it. Why can't we just say our board vision and mission? Why, what, there's a dozen different ways to show, show your patriotism. There isn't one way, and us kind of voting on this says this is the way. As elected officials, we take an oath to defend the Constitution. And to me, that is the foundational document and structure of the United States, not the flag. But again, part of me feels that this, what happened today, the, the speakers in favor of this, it, it makes me feel like it wasn't actually about the pledge itself or the values espoused in the pledge. When you have speakers saying that white privilege doesn't exist, when you have a speaker saying the N-word, when you have a black woman being silenced, when you have someone saying they had to listen to a Muslim whatever, when you have people belittling the students who've been coming to our board to ask us to take action, it's hard to believe that this is actually just about the pledge. So even if I vote yes on this, it's because I'm going to do it with some conditions because it's very clear that SBCC and in the United States there isn't liberty and justice for all. You have black students, faculty, and staff coming to us and being marginalized on campus and not listened to here. And in the United States, you have black Americans incarcerated at incredibly higher rates than white Americans. You have, you have the United States military going around the world starting wars and bombing villages uh, and not protecting their freedoms, but bombing and killing people around the world. Um, 
this country has never had liberty and justice for all. Never. And we, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but we're working to get there, but it is a fool's statement to say that there is liberty and justice for all in the United States of America or in Santa Barbara or at Santa Barbara City College. And it's always elevated one religion over all others, even though there is a plethora and diversity of religion in the United States of America. So to close, if we move forward with putting the pledge, I'm going to request we do two things. First is at the end of the pledge, when it says liberty and justice for all, we, I'm going to do it. I don't know if everyone else will, but I'm going to say someday at the end. And that's a normal thing that's usually said. Other, I've, I've heard it many other places, but I'm going to add the words, the, the words someday. No, you, you, I have freedom of speech to say that. Thank you very much. Um, next, I think, I think it's good that the resolution said it, but I think we're going to need to say it at every meeting that uh, it is not, no one is obliged to say the pledge, and it is perfectly valid to sit, to kneel, to stay silent, or to do anything, but I think we need to reiterate that at every single meeting. So you could say we're going to do the pledge, but you can also, you have to also say no pressure, your patriotism, your citizenship, your Americanism, your whatever is being questioned because you didn't say 31 words. Uh, and finally, I want to really plead the board to like, let's put this behind us and let's get to the real work of addressing the housing and food insecurity our students face, the racism they face, the sexism, the not perfect completion rates, the xenophobia, the homophobia on campus, and truly allow our students to thrive because that's what our actual job is. And so we've completely failed in that arena. And so let's vote on this and get on with serving the people we need to actually serve. Trustee Parker. Thank you, uh, Trustee Abood, and I won't uh, repeat um, what he said. Um, I do want to share that, for those of you who don't know, this is my fourth regular board meeting. And, um, but I did serve for 12 years on another board, and uh, at the beginning of each of those meetings, we stood up and said the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and honestly, I didn't think of it as a, a hugely patriotic moment. It was a moment for that board to remember that we serve the public. Um, and it was for the board to have that time to remember that we were serving the public. Um, and I think I was a little bit naive about it, um, both in the comments. Some of the comments tonight were beautifully eloquent, and I so appreciate them. And some of them were really terrible and hard to hear. And it was the same. I'm sorry I was not able to respond to all the emails that we got, but some of the emails that we got were absolutely vile. And um, it was an eye-opener, the way it can be used to divide the, um, the people of this country. It was, it was sad. But I agree that it has become a distraction um, and that we aren't able to get to uh, the uh, critical business of the board. Um, and I uh, would heartily support uh, what Trustee Abood uh, has suggested, although I believe that each of us should be able to say the pledge in our own way. Um, what I would actually talk more to is the process. I am, as you know, new to this board. And um, I, don't, I don't think it's an issue that's new with our current board president. I, and I highly respect you, Trustee Miller, President Miller. And, and I know that um, your heart is absolutely in the right place. Um, that this, there is a historical pattern with this board um, that I've been starting to observe as I come on new of, of uh, lack, both a lack of the president um, seeking out input from the board and from the board turning back and giving input to the president. Um, and so I hope that we use this as an opportunity to reflect on what has historically happened with this board. Um, and the role that the president plays and the role that each of us play as board members um, and that we have a chance soon to come together and, um, and make some changes so that we can get to the business of the board in a way that is productive. Um, the next thing that I would add is that in uh, essentially one meeting, we have been able to put forward this resolution of the governing board about the Pledge of Allegiance. I would ask that in our next meeting, after having discussed this for, for uh, months and having people come to us uh, uh, about this issue for months, that we have a resolution regarding racism and anti-racism on the campus. Um, and I hope that I would find another board member to support me on that. 
Any other uh, comments? Trustee Nelson. Your mic's not on. on. Can you hear me now? I don't need to repeat what's already been said by other board members, but um, there was some of you who don't come to our meetings very often, or maybe look at them, uh, you heard people saying that nothing's been done, nothing's been done. And they may be pretty much right that they've seen being done. There's been a lot being done since they talked. There's been investigations conducted and ongoing investigations. Um, don't have all the results to display in public yet. These things take a little bit of time. Santa Barbara City College, like most educational institutions, and especially Santa Barbara City College, um, we have a very transparent form of government. We believe in uh, complete transparency. And in fact, it's almost like managing by committee. It's almost at times hard to make decisions and then proceed. But when we write new policies or want to make a change, it goes through three different boards on campus and you know, procedures and procedures. So it doesn't happen real, real fast, but it also doesn't happen without a lot of, nothing happens without a lot of thought going into it. I, as a board member, heard every one of the complaints and I attended every one of the meetings that the students came and talked to us about racism. And I've asked for reports on every one of those incidents. I still don't have all of those reports, but I am confident and have been told by more than one source that these reports are, are somewhat completed. Many are, and they are in process, and we will have them soon. It's really hard to take actions on things when you don't have facts. He said, she said, don't warrant, um, doesn't warrant immediate drastic action. We'll have quiet, please. It's, it's my please. turn. I listen to you people out there. I give up. With this, I quit. With the person interrupting, be quiet. You've already been called out of order once. Please be quiet. Trustee Nielsen, are you done? Thank you for listening. It's not easy. I didn't come with a prepared speech. I didn't try to address everything. Um, things will be done, and it's been painfully slow, and this board member, and I'm not alone, is not happy about that. Um, but change is happening. The process, it, things take time. The process is all important. Without process, there's anarchy. And you saw some of that surfacing this evening points of order. May sound rude, may, may sound like we're trying to put people down, but we're trying to give everybody a chance to speak to us. We want to hear what you have to say. Um, some of you understand like the rules we work under, like maybe you know about the Brown Act, so we don't have secret meetings and talk to each other behind the scenes. That's against the law, and I don't want to go to jail, so I don't do that. So sometimes it takes longer for me to find out about some things. Sometimes it takes longer for somebody to get back to me with what I want to know. And then it's not just me, because everybody else wants to know things too, or we all want to know the same things. And then some things maybe shouldn't be done in public until we have proper information. But this board, I know, and I've been sitting on it for six years, um, does listen to the speakers. I listened to every one of the people that came in protest and the, the students that came in uh, reported the discrimination. <laughs> Quiet. We do care and we are taking some action and I apologize that it's taking so darn long and I'm not any happier about it than some of you. But that doesn't mean that we gave up. So thank you. For those of you who voted for me, thank you. Sorry I volunteered, but I did it, so I'll see it through. Any other, any other comments on the motion? <laughs> Trustee Gallardo. Thank you, Trustee Miller. I just want to thank the community. And I actually, with Jonathan, Trustee Abood, what you said about, you know, that for folks, they weren't here for our mission. And I think everybody here is for our mission, Trustee Abood. 85, 86, it's shooting now 87% of our budget goes just to salaries and benefits. Without the foundation, our students 
can't have the mission that you would need for them to further their educational goals. Trustee Abood, you know that community colleges are the pipeline for many of our unrepresented students. And so we need the community. The community, you know, I'm a K-12 teacher. I have seen the heart of the philanthropic community come forward and step up. Uh, I know Kate, you were on Santa Barbara Unified School Board. I work for the school board. It's also not a perfect board. And they too are lacking in money. And they desperately need the community to support them. We have a facilities master plan that hasn't gotten underway because unfortunately, Lindsay Moss and the team have been taking care of other stuff. We can get our accreditation reaffirmed if our facilities are not up to date. If you're a homeowner, as I am, as my in-laws are, you have been paying into our public school systems. Your bonds are lines going down. And I know that because my father-in-law showed me his tax bill. So for us to say that the community is not here for our mission, everybody here is for our mission. Santa Barbara is an amazing community. And I have been able to work with kids on the east side, on the west side, and now on the upper east side. And I have seen the heart of this community pour out for kids and families in a way that no other community has. And so without the folks here, Santa Barbara City College is not going to be able to fulfill its mission and to get kids and families and adults and our elderly what they need. And education is what's going to get our communities to thrive. So I just want to thank everybody here. And I want to remind our board that we need our community and our community needs us. Thank you. Trustee <laughs> Cronier. Trustee Hasman, do you have any comments? I disagree that this agenda item on the pledge has been a distraction. I think that it is an important issue. I think that it is important that our community, members of our community, came out to talk to us about it and what it meant to them. I went to private schools. We didn't have the pledge, and I didn't give it a lot of thought because it was not within my educational uh, upbringing. But those schools were certainly no less patriotic and committed to community than I know each of you are. And what I heard tonight were deeply personal stories and deeply personal feelings about what the pledge means for you and for this community and for this college as a public institution. And I appreciate that. And I thank each and every one of you for coming out and talking with us this evening. It's been a long evening, and many of you have stuck it out the whole time. And that is um, important because you, too, get to hear from everyone who wants to speak. The community, in my view, and in the view of the folks who train us about how community colleges operate, the community is the shareholders of the college. You are the people, as Trustee Gallardo just said, who support this college. You are the people our students need to succeed. And we are grateful for that. And we are grateful for your contribution to helping SBCC succeed. So thank you for coming out. And thank you for speaking with us and letting us know what you think. Well, I, I said something earlier to the effect that democracy is messy. It's also the system that I think works best for people. Um, certainly, it works best for Americans. It's, we, we have to learn to live with the messiness. The admonition I would offer is to see if we couldn't come to the point where we don't assume that if we disagree with each other that we are adversaries or that we are the enemy. Uh, I, I, the, the Pledge of Allegiance is, is going to be ours. I, I, I can predict that vote. Um, I, but I don't assume that simply because you can recite the Pledge of Allegiance that you are a patriot. Neither do I assume that because you choose not to recite the pledge that you 
are not a, a patriot. I assume everybody who spoke tonight is a card-carrying patriot of the United States and, and that you, you mean to behave that way. And, and I would offer uh, the suggestion that one of the things that we can do most effectively is to help those who have served in the military uh, as veterans, people who come back and who have great difficulty transitioning from, from military service into civilian life. There, there are things we can do to help that process. And I would, I would think that that would be certainly one indication of my patriotism, something that I do. Uh, I, I am also a veteran. I, uh, we had a number of emails, some of which were, as, as Kate said, really, really terrible, vile. I've never been called those things before in my life. And the suggestion that nobody on this dais is a veteran was really offensive. And what I'm having to to deal with is not to be offended and just to to assume that okay so there are people who who don't know and and uh, maybe they don't care um, but I do care I do care very deeply about this country um, and and therefore I will I will support this because I want us to get back to the issues that have to do with teaching and learning and making sure that each student who attends Santa Barbara City College has an equal shot at succeeding. That's why we're here. Thank you all for coming tonight. I, I appreciate the time. I know it's time consuming. You sat here for hours and you've offered your testimony. And please understand that those of us sitting up here really do know how to listen. So I think every uh, trustee has uh, spoken, so I would uh, call for the vote at this time. Uh, Trustee Miller, can I ask, Trustee Heslin, just a technical question, if we want to keep the numbers in the story correct. It says it was historically, since 1959, a local resident in July 2018, we added it. Would it be okay if I make an amendment? Would you second it that it says, and later removed from the board agenda? on January 10th, just so we keep the storyline consistent with dates and it's clear. Because um, I think I heard Trustee Abood saying we never had the pledge before, and we did. We had it since July, and we yeah. said it at every meeting. So would you be okay with adding that amendment? Sure. Angie, did you get that? It's uh, not a substantive Just amendment. technical, it's just yeah. technical. Mm -hmm. sure. So, Madam Secretary, is this a roll call? Yes, so, it is. If you uh, could call the roll. Student Trustee Ibeti. Aye. Trustee Hasland? Aye. Trustee Nielsen? Aye. Trustee Gallardo? Aye. Trustee Abood? Aye. Trustee Miller? Aye. Trustee Parker? Aye. Trustee Croninger? Aye. Okay. So the motion uh, for the resolution passes, and we will now move on to uh, item 5.1. Approval of the minutes from our meetings of December 13, 2018, special meeting of January 9, 2019, and the regular meeting of January 10, 2019. Do I hear a motion to... This is the exciting part. <laughs> <laughs> I move approval. And do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Is there any discussion? No discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And, and with the, um, with the continuation of the item 6.1 on the Ombuds program, uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting's adjourned. <laughs>